Okay. Um, I'm going to call the meeting to order, and this is the uh, regular City Council meeting for September 18th, 2017. Uh, welcome all of you here this evening, and also those of you who may be watching later on on YouTube. Um, first order of business is I'd like to ask that you join me and staff and Council for Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So again, welcome all. And um, also, uh, just a quick reminder, if you have any electronic devices, please turn them off or put them on airplane mode or silent or all of the above so that we don't interrupt the meetings. Also a reminder to ourselves and staff to do that. and. Uh, with that, uh, we're going to move on to introductions quickly. I'm going to start at the far end. I kind of change this up once in a while. It kind of helps keep me on my toes. Uh, we're going to start at my right at the far end. We have um, our chief of police, Paul Falls. Our city attorney with Kennedy and Graven is Ron Beatty. And then next to him, we have our community development director, David Abel, our finance director, Brian Grimm. And next to me, our city administrator, Mike Baroni. I'm Lisa Whalen. I'm the mayor. And then to my left, I have council members, Patricia Thol, Pam Mortensen, Michael Molitor, Shannon Bruce. And then on the end, we have our city, uh, city engineer, excuse me, Paul Hornby with WSB, our city clerk, Chris Lindquist, and then our HR communications coordinator, Cassandra Tabor. So again, welcome. Uh, next, we have approval of our agenda. There's two changes that I'm going to make. One, I'm going to pull consent agenda number E. We're going to bring that back to our next meeting. That's a fire code, and that actually needs to be an ordinance. So we're going to have to um, do that during business items at our next meeting. And then we're also going to add under business items number E, and it's going to be a discussion regarding the Enchanted and Tuxedo Road projects coming up. So that would be an addition of 6E. Are there any other changes or additions to the agenda? Um, I would like to poll letter C. C. Okay, uh, we'll do that then uh, under claims. You want to still discuss it, right? So we'll yep. do that under claims. All right. Okay. With that, is there a motion to approve the agenda as presented with those additions? So moved. Okay, is there a second? I'll second. Okay, Ms. Bruce made the motion and Mr. Molitor second that. Any further discussion? <coughs> Hearing none, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. So next we have several um, special presentations, introductions, I believe. Ms. Cassandra, you're, Ms. Tabor, you're on. Yes, Mayor, members of the council, I have three newer staff to introduce you to you today. So I'll start with Anisha. So if you just want to step up to the front. Uh, Anisha Mueller joined us on the 28th of August. She is our customer service and communications assistant. Many of our residents have already had the pleasure of interacting with her and hopefully learning her name. So as she gets familiar with everybody, she has uh, a background in private medical um, administration. So, yeah. well, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for allowing me to be part of the city. Um, it's been a great first couple of weeks. Everybody's been great to me and so fun to work with. And it's really just interesting to learn all of the processes. So, I appreciate it. Well, we're glad to have you here. You have some big shoes to fill, as you know. <laughs> Joni was with us for many doing years. <laughs> you are doing a great job so Thank far. You. When We really enjoy having you here and part of our team. So, <laughs> welcome. Welcome. And Mayor, she has not asked us yet for a dollar for every time somebody said you're the new Joni. So. <laughs> <laughs> It'll take a while. So. <laughs> so, okay. And then next we're going to work backwards in time a little bit, Mark, if you want to step up. So Mark has actually been with us since June, but he hit the ground running so ferociously that we've put him to work and have not given him a chance to come in and be greeted yet. So um, Mark Klein joined us in June on the 19th. He comes to us from private sector, large equipment, um, and like I said, is off and running and doing a fantastic job. Yeah, so I just want to say thanks to being part of the whole group here, so it's been good time fun working uh, with new people again so it's been really good 
Good. Well, welcome, welcome aboard. We're glad to have a full public works group again. Yeah. So, yeah. welcome yeah. aboard. Yeah. Thank you. And last but not least, Carter, if you want to jump up. Carter's getting the worst of this. He's been on the job for a matter of days, and we're making him come before you. So, uh, the good news is that Carter was able to be a part of our um, water treatment plant dedication ceremony. So, he got an inside tour, which is kind of nice when you're a couple days into the job. So, he joined us on September 11th. Comes from a background of private agriculture. Again, lots of experience with the big equipment, and he too has hit the ground running. So, we're very excited to have him on staff. Yeah, I'm just grateful for the opportunity. I'm excited to work here. Great group of people I get to work with. It's, it's a lot of fun. I'm just excited to be here. Good. Yeah, it is a great group. Our public works department has a lot to do. So we're, we're again, we're glad that you two are on board. So I think we're going to do some pictures. We are. So if the three of you will come back up, we'll grab a picture of the mayor. They got no more. <laughs> <laughs> Only the mayor. <laughs> Okay, so that concludes our special presentations for this evening. Uh, next is persons to be heard. I don't have people signed up. I'm assuming that those in the audience are here for the public hearing uh, regarding the um, assessment. So we'll hear from you folks in a little bit. So now we will move on to our consent agenda items. We are going to be removing item number C, and that's approving our claims. And we are going to be approving A, approve our work session meeting minutes from September 5th, 2017. <coughs> and then approve our regular meeting minutes from September 5th, 2017. And then D is a resolution for a step increase for Knit Red Key in our Public Works Maintenance Department. And then E has um, been, been pulled as well. So we have A, B, and D. Is there a motion to approve those three consent agenda items? So moved. Okay, motion has been made by Ms. Thole. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, and seconded by Ms. Mortensen. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. So see Ms. Mortensen. Yes, um, and I did talk to Paul about this prior to um, our meeting. Uh, there was a claim for the irrigation um, repair for Lyle Park for almost $19,000. And I just wanted to have an explanation because that was not part of the um, uh, original project. And it just kind of caught me in the off guard. So. Okay, well, the, um, uh, any anthropony person to ask a question or be in interested in that topic. Um, so the irrigation, the city has a uh, preferred vendor to do that work, especially the one for Lyle Park. It's a different type of irrigation system. And so, uh, council members know that this isn't like a yard irrigation system where you have a one inch line and the little pop up heads. It's a large three inch diameter piping system. And it was uh, specifically removed from the scope of the parking lot design uh, so that when the parking lot is done, then uh, Public Works could have their irrigation vendor come in and reconfigure the irrigation system. So that's what you're seeing. At the time, uh, when the discussion was occurring whether that should be part of the project or not, um, the estimate of cost for the system was twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars to do that work. So nineteen thousand is a little less than that. Part of the reason for that was that there's a lot of unknowns with the system, and the vendor, the preferred vendor that the city is using, um, actually knows the system, and so knew about it, and um, uh, the I guess the thought behind it was they want to have had a bid to the subcontractor who knew nothing about it and then screw it up. So um, that was the logic behind it at the time. Um, and now going forward, Lyle Park will be worked on 
quite a bit going forward in the future. So that's something so we'll be able will to occur. This will, I would anticipate this again. It would occur um, as the as more development occurs in the park. One of the things that makes things difficult um, is that these irrigation systems there's there's not a layout for it. At least you know it might have been a layout initially, but <coughs> as far as how it was actually laid out, maybe not exactly. So knowing exactly where these pipes are is a bit of a unknown. So the more unknowns you put into a bidding package, um, the more the price goes up. Uh, so because you're putting risk on a contractor. So um, having a vendor that knows the system and knows how to repair it um, is a good choice to, to do it in this fashion. So yeah. I'd anticipate that happening again in the future. Thank you. Okay. One more question for you, Paul. Um, you talked about not knowing the exact location of the pipes. Um, I believe now with new irrigation systems, it's pretty common to lay what's called a tracer line with the, the pipes so that they can be located. I mean, that's the problem with pipes is you can't locate them if they're not metal. Mm -hmm. uh, is that our practice on this going forward so we can start to get some kind of an idea of what we have there? It can be. Um, we do that with all of our water main. Our water main is plastic. Right, okay. Yeah, so we do that with those large diameter pipes. With this, at the time, there's not tracer wire for it. So you, you know where your control boxes are, and I think there's a general layout of where things are, but not an exact layout. So I'm kind of hearing that it probably isn't cost effective to do tracer wires just because of the... I would say on new systems, probably. It wouldn't be cost effective to do it on this system. And then if I can make a comment, I um, did talk to uh, Gary Peters, our public works superintendent today about this issue because um, after talking to both uh, Council Member Mortensen and Council Member Molitor today on the phone, they both had concerns about this item. So I needed to educate myself a little bit more about it. Paul uh, summarized it quite well about them being a three inch line versus kind of your home system one inch line. Um, the vendor that he said is our preferred vendor Gary, when he tried to repair this system four years ago, three years ago when he got here, um, he called a few people that he knew uh, to do large scale. This is essentially a 10 acre park. Um, he called and they all recommended this same guy. So that's why he, he uses them as a preferred vendor. Uh, what Paul said is true about the, the park, about the uh, amenities going in, um, kind of changed up the, uh, the layout. So as most people may or may not know the parking lot was not intended to be as small or as large as it is, but because some um, uh, economies of scale and putting in a 30 lot versus 60 lot, some of the council members that are on the council last year will remember this. Um, we decided to go with the larger lot, and of course that meant um, that we might hit the irrigation system. The layout of the irrigation system was designed back in when was the park put in, David, 12 years ago? Uh, yeah, it was six. Those six, yeah. so you know, you look at 11 years old. They, they laid all the the conduit for the, the sprinkler system back then. They have spaces. We thought at the time, whatever we thought at the time back in 06, there's been accommodations made for. We won't put sprinklers here because we think the parking lot's going to go here. We won't put them here because we think the playground or the ice house or wherever it might go. Um, but when you expand and change your parking lot, you're going to hit some lines. So that's what happened. Okay. Any other questions? Otherwise, um, if we're okay with that, do you want to approve the claims then? I just say so moved. So moved. <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> okay, motion has been made by Ms. Mortensen. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, and seconded by Mr. Mallow to approve the claims <coughs> as presented. Um, any further questions or discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes 5-0. That concludes our consent agenda item, so we'll move on to our public hearings. We have two public hearings this evening. One, we'll start with the very hopefully quick one, and then move on to the uh, Halstead assessment one. So we have a temporary one-day on-sale liquor license request from the Northwest Tonk Alliance. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Thank members you. of the Council. The Northwest Tonk Alliance submitted an application to host the We Can Wine Fest um, last year it was called the Sip, Saver, Saver, and Shop. So it's a similar fundraising event this year that will be held on October 14th um, from 5 to 9 at Voyager Environmental Cent uh, Center. 
The state statute requires the city hold a public hearing in order to give the public time to speak to the issuance of the temporary license. So that's why we have to hold a public hearing. Mm -hmm. um, the city did publish post and mail notices to neighbors within 500 feet. And as of to date, I have not received any comment in regards to this item. Staff is recommending approval of the one day temporary on sale liquor license to the Northwest Tonka Lions in conjunction with the We Can Wine Fest fundraising event to be held on Saturday, October 14th at the Voyager Environment Environmental Center with the conditions stated in the staff report. Okay, does council have any questions of staff? Okay, so I'll open the public hearing. So the public hearing is open. Anybody that wishes to make a comment or have questions um, regarding this uh, one day on sale liquor license for the Northwest Lions or we can, may do so at this time. Okay, so I'm not seeing anybody rushing to the podium, so I'm going to close the public hearing and take it back to council. So we need a motion to approve the temporary one day on sale liquor license for the Northwest Park <coughs> Alliance. So, so moved. Okay, motion has been made by Ms. Thole and seconded, I believe, by Mr. Molitor. Correct. <laughs> okay. okay, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Now we'll move on to the exciting part of the evening. We have another public hearing and that is for the special assessments for Halstead Drive and Farm Hill. Sir, um, Farm Hill Street Lane Drive. Road Drive. Drive. Okay, thank you. Um, who's first? That's that would Ms. be me, uh, okay. Madam Mayor. I do have a PowerPoint presentation, and there's also a council memo okay. I can go through uh, with the council as well um, as part of the part of this presentation. Okay. So this is the uh, public hearing for the assessments for the Halstead Drive Street Improvement Project. Uh, it's city project. 1-16, The project included Halstead Drive uh, from <coughs> Highland Road on the west end to just east or just west of Lakeside Drive, about 200 feet west. Farm Hill Circle down here, this cul-de-sac, uh, we decided to pull that out of the project <coughs> because when the trunk water main went in, uh, the pavement performed well and it's in good shape and there's no reason to take that up. and. Um, reclaim that. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I should remind the council of is that uh, the assessments are for the improvements on Halstead Drive. When we were going through the water main project and we saw the condition of Farm Hill Drive and Farm Hill Circle, uh, we thought as long as we're doing Halstead Drive that we should improve that roadway as well um, by the city's policy uh, and past practice uh, when there are cul-de-sac streets that um, enter onto where their only access on or off uh, into the street system is by the road we we're reconstructing that they are included in the assessment. And uh, this has been carried on in that same fashion. Uh, the improvements are Halstead Drive include a 32 foot wide bituminous surface roadway that meets state aid standards uh, from Minnesota State Aid. And the section is on the screen. It's basically uh, 18 inches of sand, uh, 8 inches of aggregate base, and 4 inches of pavement. Um, with 12 foot driving lanes and four foot shoulders. Uh, as a proposed improvement, some of the traffic calming, uh, there's an, this the traffic calming and it's also a necessity for the improvement. Uh, but the installation of a T intersection at the existing north 90 degree bend, um, MnDOT does not allow uh, those gentle curves or sharp curves in the roadways anymore. So you have to look at them with other geometric considerations uh, or a T-type <coughs> intersection. Uh, so that would be a stop condition in all directions. We'll provide a stub to the west for the farm field that's to the west in case that ever does develop. It would be a stub street there. Installation of a mini roundabout at the existing intersection of Farm Hill Drive. Uh, again, that's uh, twofold, uh, maybe threefold. One is to uh, provide a controlled intersection in an area that um, uh, allows for it without um, uh, needing excessive right away or easement. As compared to a T intersection, it uh, provides a controlled intersection at 
at three actual street legs. Um, if we were to put a, try to put a roundabout at the northerly T, that northerly intersection, there's not an intersecting street. So MnDOT would never approve that as, a, as an improvement. And You're talking about where, down by the Wade-Clark property? Yes. And that's where we had first talked about doing the um, roundabout for, the, for yes. the turnaround for the boats? Correct. And then um, the uh, other complication with that is the Clark Drive would be right in the middle of the roundabout. That would never be allowed. So that it just was not going to work. Uh, it also had some environmental concerns there by expanding that circular intersection in that location. Uh, but overall, it, wouldn't, it also would not be approved because there's not another road there. So now is it going to be a gentle curve? No, it's a 90 degree stop. It's a 90 degree, okay, yeah, yeah, that's right, okay. The mini roundabout provides uh, controlled intersection at Farm Hill Drive and Halstead Drive, but it uh, allows for free flowing movement. Um, one of the things that um, it also helps in is that oftentimes these rural stop conditioned intersections aren't always obeyed by drivers, so it also provides a means of allowing it to be a, a controlled intersection but free flowing. And it provides an area for our vehicles to turn around instead of utilizing neighborhood streets. Um, there has been some discussion about not having benefit for that roundabout. Well, one of the things the roundabout does is prevents uh, people from going into the neighborhoods and using the cul-de-sacs to turn around. Uh, it also reduces traffic issues, uh, typical of multi-directional stops. Um, so what I mean by that is it allows for the flow of traffic. Uh, pavement markings include centerline and fog line striping, so we will have a defined centerline on Halstead Drive uh, as opposed to the gravel road, which did not have that. It also provides delineated shoulder areas, so it will be a white fog line at the shoulder lines. And I'm not going to say that's a pedestrian way, but it provides a defined area where the shoulder is. <coughs> Uh, replacement of existing storm sewer crossings, uh, clean regrading ditches to improve the, the area drainage, uh, installation of new water services to the right way limits to serve a few properties along the uh, Halstead Drive, and that's off the city trunk water main that was put in um, in 2015-2016. Uh, those properties are west of Lakeside Drive and, and north of Farm Hill Drive. I think there's four or five of them in there. The, did they request those, that? Pardon me? Did they request that? No, we're putting them in so we don't have to come back and dig the road up again if somebody wants to service it. Oh, okay. And uh, we're not assessing for the water services that are going in. That okay. is going to have a special connection fee for those that would benefit from that. If in the future they wanted it. Correct. Okay. And I think I've had at least one. I've had one uh, request or inquiry Inquire. into whether they can connect. Okay. Farm Hill Drive Reclamations is basically 24 foot wide between the surface. So what we end up doing with uh, a reclamation project is grinding up the existing pavement. And we incorporate, we grind that up and mix it in with the aggregate base that lies below. And we reshape that road to reestablish the crown and then we put a new pavement surface on top. And if you've been down Farm Hill Drive, I think in the uh, preliminary in the feasibility report, I included photos in the presentation to show how bad that pavement is. Uh, the estimated project cost is three million four hundred sixty thousand dollars. Improvement bonds uh, are two million one hundred sixty thousand dollars. Plus, also there's the bonding costs and so forth that are in, that are added on to that. Municipal state aid we're utilizing one million three hundred and two thousand eight hundred dollars. Special assessments are six hundred ninety two thousand seven hundred and seventy dollars. Now that is before um, as we get into some discussion there's four parcels this, that staff is recommending to pull off the assessment roll largely because they're unbillable buildable they're well end mm -hmm. properties. Uh, the improvement bonds include city funded costs supported in part by special assessments. So for the surface and, and there are also surface and drainage improvements included. Uh, assess the benefiting properties on Halstead Drive is one residential equivalent unit uh, that uh, is recommended as the same in the, in the feasibility report as 14,000 
$818.49 per unit, so that's per, per property or per parcel. <coughs> when we say per unit, I mean per parcel. Farm Hill Drive would receive 75% of a residential equivalent unit, uh, which would be $11,113.87. Uh, stated funds are used to buy down the project costs, essentially reducing the city funding. Uh, the assessment parcels. Uh, previously in a work session, the council, the consensus of the car council would pull two parcels off. This one here was Ewalt. They were already assessed on the Highland Road project, and it's been the city's past practice not to assess somebody twice for a road improvement. The other was this parcel right here that's owned by Evans. And that one is largely wetland, and there is a little bit of upland, but beyond, it's within what would typically be a setback, so it's really not a built parcel. The special assessments, the assessment process does follow Minnesota Statute Chapter 429. As far as the public improvements, this has been a very public process, we actually, actually the city's gone above and beyond what it needs to to fulfill those requirements in the number of public meetings we've had. Um, for a written objection uh, to appeal it must be presented in writing and signed by the owner prior to or at the assessment hearing. Uh, to appeal the assessments, the owners need to serve the mayor or the clerk within 30 days after adoption. Preferably the, the clerk, right? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Usually just the, wanted to clarify that. <laughs> All right. Uh, to appeal assessments, owners must file the appeal in district court within 10 days of service to the mayor or the clerk. Uh, the interest rate is set at the time of the assessment certification. Uh, the city did have a um, sale of bonds this morning, so we do actually have that interest rate. And uh, uh, Finance Director Brian Grimm will talk about that here in a little bit. Whoop. Got ahead of myself. Uh, first installments will be payable on or before the first uh, Monday in January of 2018. Assessments are paid over a 20-year term. Interest rate uh, would be 2% greater than the interest rate on the associated bonds that are issued. Uh, the options for payment are to pay off uh, the full assessment to avoid interest, and that has to take place 30, within 30 days after the adoption of the um, assessment roll. Uh, applied to, it's applied directly to property taxes. Uh, the city does allow residents to pay off a partial payment of the assessment, but then they would extend the remaining amount over that 20 year period. And when, when would they have to pay it off or make a partial payment without, without paying interest? What's that yeah, date? Within that's, that first 30 That's days. within 30 days. So if the assessment rule is adopted tonight, what would happen is a letter would go out telling all the residents along the affected route that this assessment rule has been adopted and that you basically what just we talked about to pay off the assessment in full and avoiding any interest you have to pay within 30 days of basically okay. I guess All right. today, September 18th would be October 18th roughly. roughly or so. Okay and I'm going to have after you're done I'm going to have Ron just clarify um, the that portion of it okay. real clear if that's okay. Sure. Okay thank you. It works for me. All right. And then the assessment schedule for Halstead Drive uh, so, um, Brian has put together the, um, this is the one you did, Brian? Correct, yeah, and basically this is an example if um, it's adopted as presented tonight, it's, you know, the Halstead um, Drive would be the 14818 and that shows us how we collect equal principal over the 20 years through the property taxes and then uh, declining interest each year as more of the remaining principal balance is paid down, the, the amount of the annual payment. Um, that's you know put on the property taxes um, goes down each year. You can see years 2018 through 2037 there for, with the total of you know principal and interest over the life of the assessment. Um, the one thing I know um, Paul referenced earlier, we did get our um, uh, interest rate earlier in the day, and it would be 4.6 percent on the uh, assessment. We um, so that was a little lower. We were estimating right around five percent. So uh, came back a little. Because the city's bond is uh, two point six percent. Correct. Yep. Okay. 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 And then, I don't know if you want to flip ahead to the the next schedule. Just show us the the farm hill, uh, farm hill drive um, schedule with the eleven thousand one thirteen and how that would be over the 
you know, 20 years through property taxes and, you know, principal interest, um, annual payment, and with the associated interest rate up there also at the 4.6%. <clears throat> so as far as the project schedule, this is right from the feasibility report, twice why it says preliminary. Uh, the project is under construction. The city did accept bids and award that. Uh, the city at the meeting on August 21st did declare the costs to be assessed and set the assessment <coughs> hearing for tonight. And so tonight we're at the assessment hearing. Construction is uh, ongoing. Uh, it, it'll be toward the, it'll be into the end of October, probably into mid-November uh, with construction. Um, certifying the assessments to the county would occur in November and then the final completion of the project will be in the summer of 2018. And that will be the last, the final lift of bituminous and then final restoration and cleanup. If that, you have questions on the presentation, otherwise I can also go through the council memo if you want. What we're gonna do, I'm, I'm just gonna kind of clarify this for the residents. So what we're gonna do is have, if staff has some more um, presentations or council has some more questions, we're gonna answer those and then we're gonna open it up and you can come up and you can ask questions, you can make comments, whatever, and we'll try and answer your questions as well. So with that, um, Paul, do you have anything else? Just a couple things. Uh, I did mention in the presentation the four um, parcels um, that we're looking at re having the council remove formally from the assessment rule. Um, Three of them have unassigned addresses. That's because they're all wetland. Okay. And one of them does have an address uh, that is from Dykoski, which is the first parcel on the very east end of the project on the south side of the road. Right. That one, uh, council asked that we take a look at that one to see what kind of a percentage of that property might be in the project, and their west property line is where we're matching in. So their property is completely outside the city limit, the pro project limits. So we're recommending that one. <coughs> Okay. Out. All right. That was yeah. We questioned that. Okay. Yeah. Another one is uh, parcel twenty five is Coocher, and that one is it doesn't it has very limited frontage and it's all wetland. Um, they have a number of different parcels, do they, they not? Do, yes. And so this is one of the wetland parcels. Correct. Okay. Not the two parcels that are quotes unquote buildable. Those those two are still in the assessment. Okay. Room. All right. And there's one parcel twenty nine is uh, Berg, and that one is again all wetland. Okay. And then uh, Farwell, parcel 36, that again is all wetland. So those, we're recommending those four be taken out. That actually will take the, um, uh, the accessible amount to $644,604.31. And that is in the memo that I prepared for the council to consider. Uh, okay. That will leave the, um, that would leave the um, accessible amount the assessments, uh, essentially the assessments will pay for just under 30% of the project if you take the, um, just the city Share. net cost, the city net cost of the project. If you look at it as a project of a whole, it's less than 20% of the overall project cost. Okay. That's when you take into effect the state aid the dollars that are being applied to this project over, over other projects. Or yeah, that's correct. what I was saying. Then yes. Okay. Yes. All right, um, Mr. Beatty, could you again one more time kind of quickly go over the appeal process and make, make it real clear f for everybody to understand? Thank you. Sure, Madam Mayor, Council. Yeah, I'll repeat what um, was in the city engineer's report uh, this evening and what was also in the letter that everyone received notifying them of this hearing. Uh, what's going to happen, as the mayor said a minute ago, is she's gonna open a public hearing and people can comment about the assessments. At the conclusion of that, the hearing will be closed and the council will consider and probably adopt the assessment role this evening. If you want to uh, be able to appeal the assessment, there is a three-step process. The first step is that you must file a written objection either prior to tonight's meeting or at this meeting, basically before the mayor closes the public hearing, that can be as simple as <coughs> saying, I object, and giving us your name and address and turning that in to the mayor, but it has to be in writing. That's called a written objection, 
All that does is preserve your right to appeal. And then within 30 days after the adoption of the assessment roll, which again might occur tonight, you need to serve the mayor or the clerk with a lawsuit because that's what you're doing. You're initiating a lawsuit. Um, the mayor joked about you know, who you were gonna serve. Usually uh, the clerk gets served because she's at City Hall and it's easier to find her than, than the mayor who does not office out of City Hall. But in any event, within 30 days, you need to serve a lawsuit on the mayor or the clerk. And then within 10 days after that, you need to file that lawsuit with district court. So it's very important that you follow each of those steps. Thank you. Okay, any other staff? Anything else? Okay, um, council, do you have any questions of staff? Otherwise, I'll comments. I had a question. We, we were given, a, or we were sent an email by a resident. Um, yeah, I'm going to be reading that. Yep. Yeah, and I, yep. I'm just curious, if does that email constitute an objection, or does, does that an objection have to be made here no, in person? I don't, I don't know what the email says, but it has to be in writing prior to tonight's meeting or at the meeting. But what it needs to include is, I object and the name and the address of the individual. It has to be clear from the writing that it is an objection. And I'll read that letter, um, and then maybe Mr. Ron, M Mr. Beatty, you can weigh in, but um, I'm not sure that he's saying that he's filing a, a written objection with this. But I, I, um, it was from Mr. Uh, Justin Wolf, and he said he would not be able to make it tonight, and so I, he sent an email, and I said that I would read it in for the public record. So, um, a good question. So, any other questions of, of the council? Otherwise, I will open it up to the public. So, okay, I'm gonna open it up. This is a public hearing, and what I'm going to do is first, I'm gonna read uh, Mr. Wolf's uh, letter real quick. Um, it says, this is addressed to the mayor, council members, and city staff. I'm sending this email as I may not be able to attend the meeting on September 18th regarding the final assessment to your residents of Minatrista and ask that it be centered, entered into the discussion. While I am in favor of this project moving forward, I am not in full agreement with the percentage you have placed on the residents of both Halstead and Farm Hill. From my recollection of meetings with the city in the fall of 2016, it appears the formula being used has not changed and is the same as what was done on Game Farm Road. As a nearly 47-year resident of Mound and or Minatrista, I'm very familiar with Game Farm Road, whose primary use is by the residents who live directly on it or need it to access other residential roads it feeds. Halstead Drive is, on the other hand, has a lot of transient traffic as a shortcut between St. Bonifacius and Mound, as well as a heavily used boat landing and parking lot for vehicles and trailers. Once the road is complete, this is only going to increase traffic on Halstead, whereas I would suspect traffic account on Game Farm has remained close to the same as it was before its completion. Another aspect of this project I think the city needs to revise revisit um, is the addition of the roundabout where Farm Hill, me Farm Hill meets Halstead. It's been made clear this is being added in order to accommodate the boat launch traffic for a turnaround since the existing spot being used can no longer remain in place, which is understandable. I've lived on Farm Hill for 16 years uh, plus now and cannot recall any accidents at the intersection of Halstead and Farm Hill So I don't see that a roundabout will provide any kind of safety upgrade Since the roundabout is not a necessity without the public boat launch traffic and does not provide any direct benefit to the residents of Halstead or Farm Hill I don't believe we can or should be charged for this addition to the project Please share this with any anyone else not listed on the email and please consider the differences in the roads current and future users when coming up with these assessments thank you justin wolf i don't and, and you can correct me i don't see that he's saying he's objecting so well mayor i, I agree he didn't use those words which i think is preferable but um you know i guess my view is that courts are going to be fairly liberal sure i think that the What's the thrust of that comment? I think it's to object at least to aspects of the project and to paying for it. And my guess is that that would be counted as an objection. But as I mentioned earlier, 
that's only the first of three steps. Okay, all right. So, um, if anybody, and we're gonna, we'll start maybe on this side, and like, or in this side, doesn't matter, whoever wants to be first. What we're gonna do is you have to come to the podium and speak into the microphone so that we can hear you as well as the video can hear you. You need to state your name and address for the record and be respectful. So with that, do we wanna start over here? Or here? <laughs> Go right ahead. I'm Doug Eric at 7300 Farm Hill Drive. And uh, my main thing is I don't think it's necessary to repave Farm Hill since we're not repaving the other set end of Halstead. I, and that's just as bad as Farm Hill is, I believe. My understanding is okay. all I have to say. All right. All right. Both, yeah. Turn okay. Okay. This gentleman here. I'm Ron Fraley. And I do have a question for Please uh, state your address too. Oh, I forgot. Farm Hill. Yeah, thank you. And good right. evening, Mr. Fraley. Nice right. to put a name with a face a name and a face well, together. We've Have we? I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna reference a couple of Sure. Conversations that we've had. But first, I have a question of our engineer on the presentation. Uh, when will it actually be paved? It's supposed to be paved this year. This year, good. The first, the first lift of the tune is this year, but that is, and oh, I've told the council this too, it is weather dependent. So, first layer and then wait till next year. Okay. I used to pave, so I, I get some of that yeah. stuff. We want it to go through one cross cycle before we put the last lift on. So I have, um, I don't read as fast as you. That's okay. <laughs> and I have two pages of stuff, and I had to write it down because I have a lot of stuff. Okay. And I'm representing, I think, a lot of people because I sent you all the uh, email last the, week. The petition, yes. The petition that's yeah. signed by everybody. Yeah. So, you know, I'm speaking for a lot of people. Okay. Um, so I'm Ron. I, I've lived on Farm Hill since the 80s. And a little history, uh, we've struggled and some would say suffered uh, with Farm Hill Drive and Halstead Drive for a long time. In the 90s, in the 2000s, traffic levels increased. And yeah, we added more homes there, but a disproportionate number or amount of traffic was generated by the population externally as it grew. Large neighborhoods were built on either side. The boat landing grew in popularity, and the city had a very difficult time maintaining the road. We all know that, right? We've worked and worked and worked. And with some of you council members haven't been here. Mayor Whalen has been here the whole time. Trafficking dust got so bad that the city began to offer dust abatement program, treating the road with calcium chloride. It was voluntary, but funded by the residents. Some paid, but most said, hey, what do we pay taxes for? In 2009, it got so bad that many of us deemed it unsafe. We got together, studied, and funded the entire project ourselves for $4,700. We then went to the city and presented and asked the council to chip in, and they did, and it was $592. But they chipped in, and there was a reason they chipped in. Again, the residents met in 2011 and petitioned the city to fund the whole program. Our argument became clearer to us that at 700 vehicles a day, the road was used by, more by outside traffic than the neighborhoods. We pointed to the safety issue and submitted that Halstead was a unique road with a ton of traffic generated by other public things like the Dakota Trail, the boat turnaround and trailer parking, the neighborhoods on both ends, and the Halstead shortcut, which we all know what that is, I hope. And eventually the city agreed to a more fair solution and fully funded the program not only for Halstead but for all of the gravel roads in Minatrista. Mayor Whalen has been involved for a long time. We've had several conversations which she can't remember. No, I do remember. <laughs> 
I don't remember meeting you. you However, I think she understands. Yeah. And although it moved at a much slower pace than residents would have liked, she was a leader in supporting shipping in and fully funding the dust abatement program. The residents got together again in 2016 after the city presented their plan for paving. The max assessment was established at uh, I think 724,000 at the time. Mm -hmm. We delivered another signed petition, which you all have now, again, that the assessment was too high. Our argument was essentially the same, however. Halstead is different because a significant percentage of traffic is or will be generated by a, a unique combination of other public sources. Now, it took me a long time to write, uh, to write that. So. Mayor Whalen and I discussed several times how Halstead was unique. And I think she agrees that it is. In our conversation we had in 2016, she came right out and said, and I'm paraphrasing, I think you have a strong argument for the assessment going down. I support you more than you think. It was right outside this door. And I think something lower would be more fair. Last week, she again indicated her support, but said she's only one vote, and the rest of the council was not on board. I just remember that. I didn't say they weren't on board. I just said, you have to talk to them. So in a nutshell, it's about the traffic that's generated by a unique combination of other public sources other than the people that live there. And it makes it unique. The percentage of road use by the assessed residents is probably less than 25% of the total daily traffic count of over 750 vehicles. We've talked about that several times. MCWD has by far the largest portion of frontage, yet is only assessed two shares, even though they have the option to develop several lots. If or when they develop, not only will they profit, but to my previous point, it will drive a lot of traffic. They will also almost certainly put up a park or open the park and may even put up a parking lot which will drive more traffic. They also have proposed building a water treatment facility on Farm Hill which will cause construction and maintenance traffic as well. Different public entity. Halstead has been known a long time as the mound shortcut. Once it gets paved, look out. Traffic goes up again. The boat landing generates a ton of traffic, and now most boaters coming in from the west side will use the west side of Halstead as the entrance. Go all the way down, whereas they used to go around most of the time to keep the dust off their boats. That's going to drive off traffic. That's another public entity. Different. The boat turnaround is being moved to the junction of Halstead and Farm Hill, like Justin said. Not only will it increase congestion at that location, but it will also be located halfway between the ends of the road rather than at the far east end. So all that traffic now comes all the way to Farm Hill and back. Another extra use. The adjoining neighborhoods will simply find an easier path and generate more through traffic. And even the Dakota Trail drives traffic. There are cars parked along Halstead on a regular basis. I know because I'm one of them. And it's because right now I can't ride my bike 
on the road because it's either too bumpy or too dusty. It's unsafe. We all know that too. And to be fair, there are parcels of land for sale to be developed. One's 55 acres. It will certainly be, divi be divided, developed, and create more space or more traffic. And they are assessed only one share. They should pay their fair share. Either now or I suggest maybe pay a share for each lot as they develop it, with the proceeds going back to the residents to offset our costs. And by the way, same with MCWD if it develops its lots. Also, to be, to be fair, it's not a bad thing to have outside traffic. It is what it is. We're just asking you to take usage into account when deciding what the assessment amount is. So in closing, it took a long time and many meetings with the city, for the city, to fully support the Halstead Farm Hill residents with respect to the dust abatement program. In the end, they did the right thing. You did the right thing. But we have only this final chance to present our case on the assessment. And I ask you to work with Mayor Whalen to discuss and hopefully support our position that Halstead has a unique set of users and it is different and adjust the assessment accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Froling. Um, so I just, uh, maybe I, you kind of bring up a couple of questions. So you didn't quite an ask them, but I'm going to ask them for you. Um, Mr. Beatty, I know we talked about larger parcels and how can we make that more fair. And you look at this and you say, yeah, there's 50 acres or 40 acres and, or 100 acres and they're just being assessed one. And um, Mr. Froling threw out an idea, which I mean, I know we can't do that, but can you explain kind of what the process is and why we really can't assess them more than one parcel? Well, uh, Mayor, Council, there, there, whenever there's a, um, an improvement project, particularly involving a road in a non-urban area, this issue comes up. And the question is, how does the council want to account uh, for the division of, of cost? And there are a number of ways in which the courts have recognized that the council can do that, and it's really, at the council's discretion. One of them is on a front foot basis. So you simply look at how much footage you have on the parcel and pay accordingly. Uh, one of them is what we've done, which is say every lot, regardless of size, regardless of potential for development, gets a single unit. And another case, a third way of doing it, which is employed sometimes, is to make is to attempt to judge how many parcels are likely to be developed out of that parcel. That's, of course, speculative because it's based on whatever the city's current zoning regulations are and people may or may not subdivide. And it's within the council's discretion to decide among those three or any other, sometimes a combination of those three, <coughs> what's the fairest method in the council's opinion for assessing for a particular project. And in this case, the council decided, at least the previous council decided, that the fairest, case, the fairest way to do that was simply give everybody one unit regardless of size. And of course, no matter what you choose, some people are advantaged and some people are disadvantaged. Right. I, and you know, I, I remember, and this is more for, for your information, this was quite a while back, um, even though I don't <coughs> remember all conversations. I do remember the, the um, city, we, we didn't even have an assessment policy. And so we said, well, we need an assessment policy. And we talked about what Mr. Beatty said, exactly that. What is the most fair? One of the things that we talked about at, at length is 
At that time, we said, okay, if we do on a potential subdivision basis, we may be triggering people to subdivide their properties earlier than what, what we want. In other words, if you have 40 acres right now and you were being assessed for four parcels, you might say, well, to heck with that, I'm just going to subdivide my property. What we have at the council, this was many years ago, we said we want to try and maintain these large parcels, maintain the rural character and quality. So that's why, that was one of the arguments, that's why we went to the per parcel basis. You may not agree with it, but that's what we were trying to do back in the day. So just kind of to answer your question. The other thing I hope is, we don't know. We don't know what the future is, but I hope that MCWD does not have plans to subdivide their land and that they keep it as such because we can enjoy and have the luxury of these very large parcels that won't have any homes on them. In fact, those two parcels that they purchased were ripe for the next stage of our MUSA. And I'm confident that they would have been included in, in a future MUSA, very, if not last go around, this go around. And you would have seen a lot of homes there. So in that respect, I think we're fortunate, at least for the time being. So with that, um, hopefully that answers just a couple of your, your questions. We'll move on to anybody else that would like to say something. Okay. Since the word object tend to be used, I've got to hear an object using in an ambiguous okay. sign. Um, I'm, a, I'm just objecting to the, the roundabout again. I talked to the engineer today, and he said um, the only thing the roundabout was going into. I'm sorry. Uh, staff is, hold on just a second. Uh, we need your name and address. And address. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, Debbie Eric, 7300 Farm Hill Drive. Okay. Um, Anyways, uh, when I talked to him today, he said that it was going in just for the benefit of a boat turnaround. Um, by law, it does not benefit the residents of Farm Hill Drive or the yeah. of Drive. So I am going to be filing the appeal pursuant to that okay. statute. I didn't know I had to do this objection. It's not in your letter. It's not something I about an objection. I think it's if you just... A written appeal. That's fine. That's what I brought. Yeah, that's fine. And you can hand it to the clerk okay. <laughs> right here. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Mayor, if I may, that statement was not correct. I told that resident the exact same thing I talked to staff about. That yeah. Well, a we traffic control ad advantage. Just as I told the council today what the reasons for that roundabout in that location are. So I didn't say it's just for the turnaround. No, but I do remember we had, we had a lot of discussions at the council how there, we were going to address yes. the boat traffic and how they were going to turn around because we couldn't do it in the location that it was currently at. And then we looked at the, at the base, the Clark property over there, and we couldn't do it there, so we had to do it there. And it is for boat traffic turnaround. I mean, we would have could have done it differently. Well, there's, that was one aspect of it. Right. And that's, that's one reason a former council member brought up right. putting it in one location or another, but that's not the sole purpose of it. So. No, I agree, maybe not the sole purpose, but I think it, it serves that purpose and then it prevents the boat traffic from going into Farm Hill Circle or Lakeside Circle and turning around. So, but we'll talk about that. So, okay. um, anybody else wanting to make a comment or? <coughs> okay, in the back first. <laughs> no fighting. No fighting. <laughs> Name and address, please. I'm Julie Goldberg. I live at 7505. Okay. And where you're talking about the roundabout being is in front of our house. Okay. So my question is, you know, I was listening to his comment about the traffic. What about the buses? You know, nobody's mentioned the buses that go. And the buses that turn around right in front of our house and go back the other way. Is it, is the roundabout gonna be large enough to, to handle that. And, you know, you were talking about Wade's property and how his driveway, our driveway is right there. Is our driveway now going to be moved? So we don't have, I know that, you, that I had heard that our driveway is kind of right where 
where in a roundabout you kind of curve around, our driveway is right there. Is that going to be, because that's going to put a hindrance for sure. us to try and get in and out. I think our engineer can answer that. Yeah, And, and I also can have our field uh, engineer stop and show you the plan, but your driveway will be accessible both directions. Um, okay. Outside of the roundabout. Correct. We, we actually did is we actually shortened the median uh, going west of the intersection to accommodate the roundabout. We actually talked to MnDOT about whether or not we had to provide two lanes for um, westbound traffic um, after the roundabout, and they stated no, it was wide enough to accommodate traffic and turning movements. So um, we left it that in that manner. Okay, and then her other question regarding buses. Yeah. Uh, the roundabout's designed to take a turning vehicle such as a bus. A, a semi can come in here and make that turn. Okay. Well, and there are lots of those with boats pulling up. Yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> All right. Well, one thing, Mayor, if I may, um, I think a lot of people are familiar with the roundabout on Highway 7. Yeah. This is, a, this is not nearly that size. Okay. It actually fits within the city's right-of-way um, as it is today. We'd have to require any additional permanent right away we did have to acquire some temporary easements uh, as we did in the other intersection as well yeah okay all right um now mr spasky you wanted to <coughs> jump up and say something so again name and address please yeah. josh spasky 7515 halstead um well first of all i have some things i wanted to say but mr Phelan, thank you for taking your time Laying all that out. So you don't have to, right? So, well, yeah, I mean, we can all repeat the same thing. I know a lot of people on the road yeah. uh, kind of first to help with that, and the amount of time you took, you laid it out very well. Um, a couple questions I have, and it's more mechanical at this point than anything, but um, first of all, when, when I lived on Maple Crest, and you guys assessed when we redid the street there, um, the payment, if we were to pay the assessment, was uh, up front was due before you certified it to the county okay. and that was due in the year of completion of the project or substantial completion right now in that in that project i think we got done in february or something it, it didn't line up so we had a fairly large amount of time before that payment was due is but but now i'm seeing it's 30 days and it, is, has that changed I, since in the last 10 years? Or, I don't think so. And, and if it doesn't get paid this year, is that still due or does that not get due then until next November? Well, I'm going to let our attorney or Mr. Grimm, one of the two, weigh in because those are good questions. Well, I've been doing all the talking today, so let Brian answer okay. that question. <laughs> and then I'll, I'll correct him if he's wrong. Okay. I think what was, what was different on the Maple Crest project, project you always the 30 days to prepay without any interest has always been that way. So whenever it's adopted, whether it's in February or whether it's in September here, you get 30 days to prepay if you want to avoid any interest. The only difference in that was if it was adopted early in the year, you could still pay before certification with the correlated interest through, you know, pretty much after that 30 days expires through, like in that case, it would have been probably March through, you know, November, you would have paid it like a half year of interest and then prepaid it off and it went to, went to the pro uh, property taxes to the county. Well, so, so I, I specifically remember it being different back then, but because I saved like $1,800 of interest by paying it by before it was certified, but um, neither here nor there, I just want clarification on it. So okay. if we're sure this is the way it is at this time, and regardless of when it, get paid, when it gets paid, we're going to be assessed at the same time, which is like now, or that we have that 30 days, if, if you guys approve it to me. Right. So that was the first question. So let, let me ask then, okay, so if the assessments are approved or some amount of assessments are approved tonight, the, the 30 days starts today then, yes. and they yes. would have until October 18th to pay in full if they don't want to pay any interest. Now, if they, if they don't pay right away, then let's say they pay in January, do they have to pay a full year's interest? Yeah. Okay, okay. then they would have yeah. to pay a full year's interest. Yeah. yeah send it to the county by November. Yeah, and, and all of this is statutory. I'm not, I'm not sure what happened uh, 10 years ago. If you saved $1,800, good for you. Mm -hmm. But the statute hasn't changed, and Brian's exactly right. The 30 days starts right after the assessment <coughs> uh, roll is adopted, which will presumably be tonight. 
that ha that's true whenever during the year that <coughs> that occurs. So you'll have 30 days to pay it uh, without interest. And then after that, you can always prepay it in any future year. The, the only trick there is that there's a November 15th deadline. If you pay it uh, before November 15th in any subsequent year, you pay interest through the end of that year. <clears throat> if you pay it on November 16th of whatever year, you pay interest through December 31st of the following year. And again, that's all controlled by statute. That's not the city's decision. Okay, so thank you. Um, the second question I have with this is, you know, game farming keeps coming up as one of the precedents. And I think, once again, uh, Mr. Jones did such a good job of laying out why we're different, sure. right? But I remember talking about game farming. I should have probably researched this before today. But do you remember what the assessment on game farm was? Because it was less than... Game farm was 13000 and 9000 respectively. Thirteen thousand ninety-seven fifty. Thirty-five percent of the thirteen thousand. Okay. Nine thousand seven fifty. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when you compare the two, and when you look at the city council setting a precedent, I mean, I think precedent is important. I would never ask you guys to break precedent, but I think you're going the wrong way on this one. I mean, I think it's so clear if Game Farm is thirteen thousand, that Halstead should be less than that. Okay. And and for so many reasons. You know, but but the traffic, uh, I mean, like like Brown said, the external public factors and what what's going to change once it does get paid is going to be massive. You know, but we're we kind of feel like we're back in that corner because we're exchanging one thing, which is the bad unsafe road that's ex extremely dusty and everything else, for a road that's going to be nice, but now it's going to have a ton more traffic on there too. Um, so. I'm just saying, based on our precedent, based on what we've done in the past, based on what the has based on what the has done, this makes sense that we should be a little less than capable. Okay. So, thank All right. you. Thank you. Yeah, can I maybe make just a couple comments to that? So, um, as far as you know, the percentage, I look back on what was paid on Game Farm Road, and those property owners paid 33% of the overall project. So just for that, I guess, Percentage-wise, it's fairly similar. It's correct. Well, when you look at the local cost, but mm -hmm. there, I think we pointed out earlier, I think we are giving credit for the amount of traffic that go through, but the state aid portion that we're applying, the $1.3 million, they're really paying 19% of the total project. So I think you've got to give some, that, and that is basically, I think, taking into account that maybe it does have a little more traffic mm -hmm. than Game Farm Road. So, I mean, I, I think those percentages... Uh, well, that can be discussed when, you know, yeah. Um, okay, one more comment, and then we're going to move on to somebody else, and then, yeah. Well, just to address that, I'm sorry, I guess I should just stay up here, but um, when you determined the state dollars for game farm. We didn't we use didn't, state dollars. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. that's what I mean. You did yeah. use state dollars because the state comes with a big onus of, hey, you have to redo this, you have to do that, it has to be the right. one. Everybody decided, the council, the residents right. on the game farm decided, hey, it might even be more expensive if we take the state money. It, right? And it was, it, yeah. right. Yeah, so it was, I mean, it was kind of a no-brainer in that, and, and they kind of you know, did something else. But with us, it's partly this, hey, now we're taking the state money, but what we're adding to do Halstead under those state standards is also quite a bit. So yes, the, the project, we may be assessed at a lower percent, but once again, and, and I'm not gonna, you know, I can't remember who exactly said this, but there's been the, the sentiment around here that when we do a project like this, people get kind of assessed in the same, you know, the same range of what's considered affordable and that we're not, you know, going out and just right. assessing people $40,000, you know, on one and something like on Highland, it was just kind of saying, well, what, what makes sense for these people, right? Because there's so many other things going on. Mm -hmm. And so once again, I'm just going back to saying what makes sense based on other right. roads are present is just a little more reasonable amount, um, you know, probably below what Game Farm was. And six years ago, asphalt was a lot more than it is now. Very well, oil was. <laughs> so, thank you. All right, thank you. Anybody else? Hi, my name is Rick Buss, 3915 Arnold Circle. 
and I, my list is worthless because Mr. Fraley uh, <laughs> said it all. More than I could have. <clears throat> but we've been having some neighborhood meetings, and it's it's it saddens me to think that the, the that came out of the meetings was, well, let's go to the council meeting and we'll we'll, we'll make our, our arguments and, and do whatever we can, but nothing's going to happen. And I was wondering. Is the city council looking out after us, or are they looking out after other interests? And it dawned on me then that we had no dust control this summer. We had, we had the same dust that we did last summer, but was it because we're having a new road that the dust wasn't going to affect us this year? Um, I was really saddened to, to, uh, to realize that there was no dust control, and we had a very dusty time of it this summer, too. So uh, just disappointing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bess. Anybody else? So, going once, going twice. Um, so I'm gonna close the public hearing now, and I do wanna thank all of you for coming. Um, I think, you know, it takes, it takes some initiative to come out and talk to the council. Thank you, Mr. Froling, for your great presentation. Um, I'm just going to start out the um, conversation here real quick and kind of tell everybody where I'm, I'm coming from. I think um, the people here this evening have made um, some very valid points. I mean, the roundabout and, and so on, and the boat traffic and trailer traffic. And, and I, I really empathize with that, and I do see the validity in, in some of the statements. The email that we got, Mr. Froling, that you uh, forwarded, um, it asked for a 10% assessment. We can't do that. Um, we do have to do a minimum of 20% in order to meet the um, state statutes. So, um, however, that minimum um, isn't the 14.8, and I would like to, um, throw out there a number of 13.5 of for Halstead and 9.5 for, for Farm Hill, and that would be very similar uh, to Game Farm and um, what we did back then. Considering that it was six or seven years ago, um, it would be somewhat of a, of a um, increase because of cost of labor going up and all of these things, and that was six or seven years ago. So. That's kind of where I'm coming from. I don't know that um, this in the city is then picking up the roundabout in its entirety. The city is looking at the traffic and saying, "Yeah, you know, you have some valid points." Um, so that's that's how I'm viewing it. If we if we can go down to 35, 3600, uh, 13, 5, 13, 6, and then uh, respectively the the 75% um, on Farm Hill. So. Which would be a little higher, I think. It might be a little higher than 9.5. Maybe it's 9.7. It's like a little bit, 10, I think. A little bit, but right in that range. And that, that I think, um, it's the same as, it really would be comparative to Game Farm. Um, Game Farm is, just so you all know, Game Farm is a connector between County Road 26 and 110. Um, I don't know if any traffic studies have been done to, to show whether increased traffic or not, but it is a shortcut as well from if you're in the north going into Mound. There's some similarities. Um, so that's where I'm coming from. So Mr. Molitor? Okay. What's that <clears throat> due to the overall number? Well, you know, I don't know what the overall total assessment, but it'll still be about the, above the 20%. And I ran some numbers, and actually, if you spread that additional amount over uh, 49 properties, which we're talking about right now, and you take that dollar amount um, and add it to the cities, we're really talking a few thousand dollars a year extra. You're, you're talking in overall tax levy impact. Right. right. I mean, it's, it adds right. up to 50, 60,000 in real dollars. Right. You're taking in real dollars. Right. To, okay. To, um, but tax. To the tax levy right. over 20 years. Right. So I just want to make that. Right. Yep. Because yeah. Yeah. Okay. we just talked about levy impact, and this was not part of it. And now you're throwing this in. That should have been brought up when we talked about the levy. It's not going to make that big of a difference. I, I have a question that might address that. Sure. If, if we were to, um, I was interested in Mr. Froling's idea of assessing these big parcels because there's such a wide disparity and it, it's a question of equity and what, what, what makes sense. 
If we were to amend our assessment policy to identify a size of parcel that we consider larger than most, that would it be possible, and I'm not sure what the law says about this, would it be possible to say if that parcel develops within 10 years that, you know, put a time frame on it, that if it develops within 10 years that they have to pay the assessment? Or, you know, yeah, council this, could yeah, we have talked about Because yeah. I wasn't on the council yeah, exactly. when we went through all this, but right. is that... Mr. Beatty, possible? you're going to have to weigh in again. And we did, it, good questions, good questions, and I asked staff the same questions, so. Well, again, the, the council can establish uh, a number of policies. I mean, what I think you're talking about is a deferral of those assess that assessment. Uh, the statute allows two kinds of deferral. One is for undeveloped parcels, and so, we have had a few cases, in fact, in uh, the Maple Crest deal a couple of years ago, there was at least one parcel that uh, somebody uh, paid an assessment on one piece and got a deferral. But, but the downside of that is that historically, the city has charged interest on those, those uh, assessments. And so they come due, and unless you pay attention to it, uh, you end up with a shockingly big number because it's the assessment plus many, many years of accrued interest. Um, you know, one of the other items, the ideas that was tossed out was the ability to sort of retroactively assess people who do subdivide their parcel. And unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. I mean, there's some, some sort of equity sense in that. But with, again, we're, we're constrained by what the statute allows the city to do. And in that case, we need to make a decision. The council needs to make a decision at the time of the assessment role adoption, which is now, as to how we're going to assess it. And with roads, we have to make assessments now. So there's, there's really no, no ability to look back in the future or, or wait until the future and then when somebody does subdivide, uh, retroactively assess them. We, can't so, and respectively, so let's say somebody has a 40 acre parcel and we say, oh, and we had, and we can't really go back now, but we said, okay, well, that parcel can subdivide in four, so we'll defer three of them until they subdivide and then they have to pay it within 10 years. But if they never subdivide, then who picks up the, the remainder of that? Is that the city's burden then? Yeah, I mean, ev every dollar that you don't assess either. <laughs> tonight or in the future is gets picked up by the rest of the taxpayers. Okay. I'm just curious. Yeah. I mean the project the project doesn't get any cheaper if you do any of that. I mean the, the, the right. project's gonna cost whatever it's gonna cost and whatever doesn't get assessed is gonna be picked up by the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. So if a deferral just means that you're assessing a property and it's just deferred till later. Yes. But is it possible to not assess the property now and assess it in no. 10 years if no. they subdivide? You no. can't do that. No, that's yeah. what I, I was trying to answer the second part of it. No, unfortunately, uh, that, that option's not available. You have to make a decision tonight at the time of the adoption of the assessment role. Who's going to be included and that's that's the only time to make that decision. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and those are good questions that we tried to <laughs> figure out. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm glad to hear that the uh, the amount for the roundabout is uh, going to be incurred by the city. Uh, all, uh, although it isn't necessarily going in because of the boat launch there. It's my opinion that if there wasn't a boat launch there, we would need, not need a roundabout. Um, uh, I do think that traffic is going to increase as far as the mound shortcut and um, that, especially for boaters who now don't have to worry about keeping the dust off their boats. 
Um, my question, if, if we could just, if you could repeat this, Brian, so I have it clear. Uh, as we go into the budget process uh, for 2000, or continue it, um, if we were to approve revising the assessments to 13.5 and then 10 plus something, whatever 75% is, uh, do you have a rough idea of how much that would affect the 2018 budget? And, and I thought you said uh, approximately $50,000, but are you saying that it's $50,000 for several years going 20, forward? Maybe, yeah, it's about, I just did a quick calculation, it's about $58,000. For 20. If you divide that over 20, it's 2,900, but there is some interest, obviously, component 3, into that. So it's probably a levy impact of about 3,000. 3, 3,000 ish a year or you know whatever for the 20 years that shifts from the assessment to the tax levy a, le a levy impact per year of 3,000 3, not 50,000 no, there correct 3,000 a year yeah. okay. um, I, I would be in favor of uh, what the mayor proposed or suggested as a starting point for discussion at, at the 13 five and the 10. <clears throat> be thirteen five hundred ten thousand one twenty five would be that'd be ten thousand one twenty five is seventy five percent of thirteen five hundred. Round it out to ten. I mean, yeah. Well, I, I don't. I mean, it's just yeah. What do we, you know? Sometimes we want to compare to game farm. Sometimes we don't. I yeah. guess it just depends on what. Okay, how that's you want, fine. How you want to do it? I guess. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for the clarification. Thank you. Game farm uh, road. How many residents are on that road? Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it was a little more dense. I think it was like there. 82 There's, or 85. Yeah, that sounds about right. 75 to 80 or something. Yeah, I yeah. think it was more in the 80s. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. So, yeah, a few more homes. And lengthwise, it's similar? Game Farm was what? Oh gosh, you really. Um, Sorry. <laughs> um, I want to say it was like 4.5 miles. But um, I, I I can't give you okay, I'm just similar. We'll say similar, but I I don't know the mileage. I'm sorry. Does anybody really know how many people that are non-residents go to that boat landing? There's it's a, a lot. lot. It's a it's a lot. Yeah, I mean, and there's there's no way of knowing. I mean. It is one or the only boat launch that doesn't charge, correct? Is that a correct? No, no, no. no. I don't. There's <coughs> We're a doing lot one of on Tetsuya Road right now. Yeah, doesn't charge. Okay, and okay. Because that that is an appeal for people to go there. They don't right. have I mean, to pay the the fee to go in and out. I, I think it. to that question about generating boat traffic, you could use that same argument for what we just did on or are doing on Tetsuya Road. There's a boat launch there, and I know because I lived there at the time that there's a lot of you know uh, external traffic that goes to the boat launch, not by residents. Uh, because residents put it in once a year and take it out once a year. Um, so I, I guess I, I certainly understand that. Understand that very well. I've experienced it, but if we're going to use that as a factor, um, that to the gentleman's concern about precedent. Sets a big precedent for tuxedo or in other in other roads that have a boat access mm -hmm. to it. Um, we only have two. So, it's just something to consider. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think we, in all the discussions I heard about tuxedo, and I wasn't here for all of them because there's, you know, that, or that was last year. Um, I never heard that as being a factor in <coughs> the process. Yeah, there's there's a boat. Well, as you know, there's a boat launch with some parking there. And I don't yeah, know if there's some turnaround area there. Right, there's so. not a lot of parking, but it okay. does generate a lot of traffic. All right. Anybody else? Um, I, okay. I, I will just, to the people that had comments, and again, I was not on the council last year, but based on the time frame that was put up there, it, it was just important to remember that this is a discussion about the assessment. The things about the roundabout, I don't necessarily agree with it being there but that was a decision that was made before I was here right. and you know th those concerns that was something I mean we're moving dirt now this is yeah so I think you know we got to remember that the design considerations were done previous to this point 
So um, that's not something to really consider here. This is just about the assessment part. Correct. So um, I think to the, to the concern, if I remember right, we did have a discussion at some point earlier in the year about dust control on the road, and I think we decided not to do that because we were going to be tearing it up. And I, if I, don't, I don't remember. I, think I don't know. I don't recall if that was at a council level or not, but uh, it may have been. Um, but that essentially is what that discussion was about. Right. Because it wasn't purposeful. Yeah, I think that it was over. I want to say it was over seven thousand dollars right. to treat that roadway. Right. Yeah. And so what we're looking at here, normally in a, in a, recon, in a reclamation, we're doing a fifty percent assessment to the homeowners. Right. And so here we're looking at. At this point, it's 19 percent. So, you know, state's kicking in 1.3 million. City is kicking in. I forget the exact number, two million, and the rest is for residents. So, it, it, those factors are all going into the unique circumstances that have been mentioned several times here. That this isn't what we normally have seen. The percentages we're seeing here are a lot smaller. So. I just want to point that out that that has been taken into consideration. Okay, Ms. Bruce, I'm I'm struggling with this. I, I I don't like having to having the other residents and miniaturists to pick up the difference, but I understand that there's external traffic going down that road, and I I understand the comparisons with Game Farm. Um, so I, 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 I would support lowering the, the assessments just, just for that fact that there's a lot of external traffic on those roads. And I, I wish, I, I was assessed for Game Farm. I wish they had done that for Game Farm. They didn't take that into consideration then. So you, if, if we do pass it, you should consider yourself <laughs> lucky <laughs> that, that we're considering it now. Um, so I, I would support the reduced assessments. And just Okay. I, where did these new numbers come from? I haven't seen them in a packet or anywhere. They came from me. Just out of thin air? Yes. <laughs> no. Um, actually, I knew that the um, Game Farm Road assessments were 13 and, and 975, um, 9,750. And so basically just factoring in, because it was done six, seven years ago, factoring in kind of a, if you will, a, um, inflationary number, <laughs> I came up with a 13.5. You can throw something else out if well, you don't. I mean, like it. It just, we, we have, I'm looking at a 110 page packet, and none of that is in here, and it just all of a sudden showed up tonight. I, it's I guess, part of our discussion. Okay. Um, it, it just would have been nice to have that little bit more of a upfront as to where that was coming from. Well, we need to have that discussion openly at the council meeting versus me giving you information in the packet. Asking, you know, because then you kind you can kind of give it get into an open meeting law violation, and I wanted to make sure that it was openly discussed here at the council meeting. And this would be a real good inflationary level because that's uh, not anywhere near two percent a year from thirteen to thirteen five hundred. But that's, that's, that's six it. years ago. If you take thirteen thousand dollars and add two percent a year, this year's rate should be fourteen thousand three hundred fifty three dollars. So and two percent. That's a two percent. That's compounded though. Correct. Yeah. That's what to each new dollar amount. Right. Going back six years, so. Well, and and I, that speaks to acting on things too quickly. I I think we need time to digest information like that because I think that makes a difference. Having hearing the compounded interest from six years ago, I think that makes a difference in what these assessments should be. If if they're going to be compared to Game Farm Road, right. I think we ought to calculate those. Um, I just took it based on what the mayor said tonight. I had no idea she was going to suggest 13.5 and 10.125. I just said, okay. Yeah. Let's yeah, staff was recommending the 14.8 and the 13.8 so was in the packet, yeah. the 11.100. Yes, yeah, so. I'll just do it right here. Yeah. Right, right. I guess it was yeah, the that's same, same point. Is that if we had some basis, I mean, if we're going to use Game Farm Road, how long are we going to use it? Are we going to use the type of Game Farm Road for the next 20 years as our basis for describing assessments? Uh, and if so, then, which I don't think is a good idea, but if we're going to do that, I mean, inflation is not imaginary. It, it happens. Uh, and I think 2% is a really low number if you go back and look at what CPI has been. Uh, you know, it, it, that's why I just was asking about where the numbers come from. 
you know, now that we're backing into it and we say it's less than 2% a year, um, <clears throat> and I think actually if you took the 14.8, it'd be two point something per year. So I, that's kind of why I was asking the question. And, and so I'm just a little confused as to the numbers now. Okay, so I did. I'd like to revise my opinion after after hearing the the inflation rate applied to Game Farm. I think I think we ought to adjust those figures accordingly to make them more comparable with taking inflation into account. Well, just to be clear, I did not use an inflation rate. I just used a straight two percent. I don't know what the inflation is for each and every year in the last six years. I I, I happen to have looked it up months ago. I think it's one point six okay. is what it was for last year. Okay. Um, well, but then previous, you'd have to look at You'd have to look at right. consecutive years. I, but don't <coughs> I don't know if we need to go with that. But rather than just pulling numbers out of the air, I, I think it, 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 I think the other citizens of Minnetrissa that are going to pick up the difference deserve are looking into those numbers and making sure that, that we are making it comparable to Game Farm and taking inflation into account. I think the 14800 came from to try to have it around 30% of our local share of the project. Right. So that's where that's that's where that was the rationale for what staff recommended. So mm -hmm. I guess you know if the council wants to adjust anything we that, And that I was think the, the the percentage for game farm was more like 27 or no, 28%. It was, 33, it was 33%. Was it 33? It was 33 I thought it was more like 28. Nope. Okay. Stand to be correct. There were just more people to spread it over. Correct. Yeah. Right. And the other thing to consider is, um, I know there was some requests um, to eliminate or take the roundabout out, or the, the cost difference between a T intersection versus the roundabout for the boats, and um, that was in your packet, and that was 36000 So if you factor in inflation, it comes up to 14000 and then you factor in um, you factor in the taking out the roundabout, you're probably going to be pretty close to the thirteen five. So we can we can bring this back, I guess, if if you want, um, or we can Some adopt it as is, or we can adopt it with adjustments. And perhaps Mr. Brian can interject too, but if uh, we don't have a lot of time uh, to make this year's certification of the county, what, what's that cut off? Is it by the end of November? No, yeah, that's uh, November thirtieth. Yep, yep. It is open, so we have we so we have a little bit. Yeah, but we'd want to bring it back probably no later than the second one in October, second meeting in October. Which, I mean, and I don't know how much more th there would be to bring back or, or talk about, though. I think it's ultimately... Would just be the number, right. Yeah, and ultimately I think it's up to council if they feel more comfortable at 14800 or 13500 or somewhere in between. So I, I don't know how much more really staff would be bringing back, I guess would be the right. question. So. Yeah, good question. I mean, I think it's more what right. council feels comfortable. We can make it work within the project if you want to do thirteen five and ten thousand one twenty five, whatever you you know, it's it just shifts the piece of the pie. I guess a it bit, makes a three thousand dollar difference. So so anybody wanna what is your pleasure? Difficult decision, I know. Um, I will have to say that I am struggling, like Shannon, with the rest of the residents of Minnetrista, um, having to take the burden of the added, the cost difference of if we do lower it. I just, um, you know, the landing has been there when probably everybody here bought their homes, so they knew there was going to be probably additional traffic. Chances are that road would have been tarred. I live on a dirt road. I hope someday it's going to be paved, but those are things when you purchase a home, you kind of know, and so I'm struggling with that. Um, so if it makes a $3,000 difference and we have 3,500 properties or more in Minnetrista, it's a dollar per, on average, a dollar per parcel a year. I do think so, that on, on other roads, if you have 
um, the, the residents that live on that road or street really for the most parts are the only ones that use that street right like for yourself for me really the only people like if we were to get, get assessed for our road I mean there's the, the visitors and well think about Tuxedo it serves Shoreland Enchanted it serves all of them. And for those roads that aren't so much through through roads, we assess that our, our full policy amount, which 50%. is 50%. We're already down to 30 or 19. However you feel most comfortable looking at it, I guess. Right. You know, we're, that's what we're right. down that, that's to. That's what my point was yeah. about. This is already it, taken into consideration. The it's reduced because we knew that $25,000 assessments weren't going to fly and no one wanted And, and oh, no, right. none of the staff wouldn't recommend that either. That's right. not, we don't want to burden right. people with that, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Where if we, what if we um, met somewhere in the middle, but not really in the middle? Um, like instead of reducing it to 13.5, we did 13.8, and instead of reducing it to 10.125, we did 10.4, or, you know, it's not going to make that much difference monetarily, but it would be more philosophical. Okay, we need to make a decision here. So we either um, make a decision tonight or we bring, have to bring it back. And as Mr. Grimm said, we'll probably be bringing back kind of what we already need tonight. Right, so and I it'll just, it's just going to be the need number. To kind of force the council's hand, but I think you guys just have to come up with a number that you can all agree on. And I think, and we do have scheduled the Enchanted and Tuxedo assessment. That's our next for, meeting. For October 2nd, yeah. also, just yeah. for, I guess. Right. Logistics. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I would suggest taking a vote on the assessments as they've been prepared and see where we are on that. Okay. All right. Then I need a motion. I would move to approve assessments as prepared. The, assess in our packet. the assessments as prepared. In our packet. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there a second? I'll make a second to that. Okay. Any further discussion? Um, well, I won't be voting for that, but okay. So hearing none, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Nay. Nay. Aye. Aye, nay, whatever. <laughs> so there's uh, three ayes. That's uh, Bruce, Molitor, and um, Mortensen, and two nays, uh, Thole and Whalen. So it... There you go, folks. So um, with that, it concludes. And then uh, we do need one more thing. Um, it, I think there were four properties Does that, in, um, that staff is recommending to remove. Do I, you need a, mo a separate motion for that? I think if, if um, the motion was to um, adopt the assessment as, present, as recommended by staff, then that would have that would include those. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, so that concludes our um, public hearings, and we're going to move on to our business items. And this is our final bond sale. So consideration of selling bonds for this would be the bond sale of 2017A. And Mr. I was going to say LRZ, you're not Mr. LRZ. Thanks for the promotion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Council members, Todd Hager from Ellers and Associates, to present um, three bonds tonight, a Series A, G, and C bond. Uh, let me pass out the sale day reports, um, if I may. Just go up here and yep. pass them on. Thank you.
Clearing out the place anyway. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, I love it when a plan comes together. Okay, so uh, everybody has a sale day report. Um, let's go through the uh, 2017A, the first one. Obviously, uh, you folks have double sided pages. I'm trying to cut costs, uh, which gets passed on. And not line. cut so many trees. Okay. 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 Yep, yep. Going green. And um, <laughs> so this, this bond issue um, is uh, three point. Um, 3.1 million of general obligation bonds, and this, of course, finances the construction of the Halstead Drive and Enchant the Tuxedo Land Improvements. And Just a question: yeah. In our packet, it says 3.250. Is am I looking at the wrong one in the packet? Yeah, you're getting ahead of me, Miss. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, That's me, um, all right. I'll, I'll explain what what happened today at the um, bond sale. Okay. Uh, it did lower it down. All right. Is it good? Yes, yeah. we like that. Of, yes, <laughs> yeah, it's good news all around. All right. um, acquisition of various capital equipment. So, so it's a three three part deal here. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that first one does uh, talk to to uh, to the sort of the public hearing here uh, tonight as well. So we can we'll go through this. Um, I'll try not to get too complicated, but we have uh, in your packet a sale day report, and you flip the page. Uh, it's got a nice summary of what transpired. Uh, between the uh, pre-sale uh, about a month ago and the bond sale today. So um, I kind of want to cut to the chase for the good news first uh, without getting into the, too much into the weeds at, at this point. Uh, we accepted bids um, competitively on the bonds until 11 o'clock this morning. Um, you received four, four bids today um, with your AA plus stable outlook bond rating too. You did maintain that, by the way. I go through that uh, as well. Just want to make sure you are aware uh, you kept that rating. Um, so congratulations there. So uh, the page in from that shows the bid tabulation of uh, how, how this, uh, who's the best and uh, who's in second, third, and fourth. So if you get to the bid tabulation page, uh, we've got uh, Northland Securities out of Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota, right downtown. Uh, came in with the best bid at 2.6085%. Uh, uh, they actually had three others that participated with that too. I mean, you got four bids, we've got three, you know, three other uh, firms that went on this too. Hillard, Lyons, DA Davidson, and United Bankers Bank uh, that went in with Northland Securities to give you that low rate. Uh, the second, uh, bid was Baird out of Milwaukee at 2.6269. FTN Financial Capital Markets from Memphis, Tennessee at 2.6707. Number four, Stiffel Nicholas out of Birmingham, Alabama at 2.6999. So the difference, uh, you know, amongst or between, I want to look at that, between the low bid and the high bid was almost $30,000 of uh, sending us out to bid and having them compete for your business, which is, which is good. And we just did pick one uh, because we felt that we didn't need to. This is a bond issue that can be sold fairly easy in the market and uh, with your very high credit rating. You're just one below the AAA. Um, we'll get you there eventually and kind of give you a hint on how you might be able to get there. It will take some doing. Um, and so this bond uh, was actually purchased uh, with a premium. As a matter of fact, I believe probably all of these, let's look at them. Yeah, it looks like um, all the bids uh, came in with a premium. So the underwriter is giving you more money than what you need for the project uh, in exchange for uh, a little higher interest rate for the investors. Um, and so what happens is the investors actually are giving Northland some uh, money to hold a higher interest rate bond because I think the market out there feels that um, rates are probably going to go up at some point and they just want to be able to remarket these easily and have a little higher value bond. So in addition, in exchange for that, uh, that premium did, uh, an underwriter's discount reduction and the cost of issuance went down as well 
Um, we had $150,000 more uh, in proceeds to be available for the project um, that we don't need uh, because we're fine the way it is, unless there's some cost overrun we don't know about. Uh, but staff agreed that to use all the premium and the cost savings to reduce the size of the bond issue. Mm -hmm. So it's no longer three million two fifty; it's three million one hundred. Okay. okay. So, and that happens quite often uh, with a uh, larger bond issue, um, higher rated city, uh, to attract bids like that. And again, it looks like they all bid with some sort of premium that way. So, um, so basically, by lowering that uh, par amount of bonds, we are in effect burning that, so to speak, burning that yield down to basically. If you look on that dip tabulation sheet, um, there's the interest rate, uh, which is going to be stamped on the bonds, and that's what you're going to be paying, but you're going to be paying on uh, less, 150,000 less of bonds. So you're bringing that yield down to that. So on, of the in bond. here it says 3%, but it says that the winning bid was 2.6085. So basically, we're paying, they're, who's paying for that? Well, the 2.605 is, uh, is how we determine what a true interest rate is for uh -huh. bidding parameters. So that takes into account um, the fee or the underwriter discount that the underwriter takes. And it would take into account premium, right? Giving you more money than what you need. And then present values it uh, throughout the, the maturity schedule. So, so that, that's sort of your effective interest rate, so to speak, based on a yield. Okay. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So, so you're issuing less bonds at a lower interest rate, um, mm -hmm. and that's good news. Yeah. So that's what we've got. So the bottom line is, uh, it's it's uh, it's much lower than what you mm -hmm. what we had predicted in the pre sale report. As a matter of fact, it's 0.21 percent less uh, if you want to look at that on a true interest cost basis. So that can affect. Um, assessments and you know, the rate on the assessments and, and all those sorts of things. So we do have uh, some of those projections uh, in here, but they're not, um, they're not, uh, that part isn't finalized, the bond issue is, but how you want to pay it back is uh, something, you know, still, still some decisions are, are to be made. So, so this is, this is the bond issue, it's final, you know, it's, it's a fixed rate. And uh, we're at 3.1 uh, million as opposed to 3.25. So we had a uh, you know, really good rating call about two weeks ago. You know, Mike was on and, and Brian and me and the analysts out of uh, Colorado. Actually, Stan of course was out of the Colorado office. So um, like I say, uh, we've got the report attached onto this uh, bond sale report. Um, you can read through it if you haven't already. Um, you might have just got it now. Um, it was available late on Friday, so I did, did not get into your packets. Um, but the bullet points um, listed on here, and then there's more detailed little paragraphs that talk about uh, the factors that went into the rating. Um, everything really stayed the same from their past bond issues at your AA plus stable. Uh, very strong economy, strong management, adequate budget performance, very strong budgetary flexibility, very strong liquidity, very weak debt contingent liability. So, um, so very strong is as top as you can get, very weak is as low as you can get, okay? And so if you kind of look through the rating reports, and I always like to kind of see what, where they've got a stable outlook at, um, last couple of pages to the rating report towards the bottom of that page it says. So it says a stable outlook reflects uh, the view that Metatrista will maintain very strong budgetary flexibility and that's basically your reserves and liquidity profile. So you can tap into those, you know, on a rainy day, which is great. So they don't anticipate changing the rating within the two-year period. Um, even, even to account for some additional bonds that may be issued maybe in the next three years or so, um, we've already got that sort of dialed in here as well. And the two waste, or the two water treatment plants with public facilities authority, those have already been dialed in actually in the last rating report as um, 
we've drawn down on that nine and a half million already, so that's already in here too. So I think that's what's keeping that at debt at a very weak level. And there's not a whole lot we can do about that. We still have to issue bonds and have to do projects. Um, I guess a nice thing about having that, if there's a nice, nice, if there's a bright side, your double A plus stable actually reflects probably the, the, the lowest score you could get on the debt side. So you can't go any farther down than that. So what could bring you up is um, just higher reserves if you wanted to think about doing that. So they could get into 70 to 75% of expenditures and they consider bumping up a little bit. What could go down is if you start tapping into those reserves. You know, so you gotta watch out um, what you do with that. Um, or have, um, there's no problem with one time um, hits to the reserve, you know, if you're gonna replenish it just for uh, things that unavoidable sort of projects that came up. Um, but, uh, but you want to make sure that you maintain those reserves at this level or, or you can bring them up a little bit if you so choose. So don't let that debt score make you feel bad. Um, again, you can chip away at that as you as bonds mature. That's, that's as good as we can do. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of a summary on, on uh, that I, I think will, you know, they, they say that you'll maintain that level for quite a while now, and if you wanted to bring it up, that's what you do, and it could go down if, if you tap into the reserves too much. But um, great bond sale. Um, again, on that, do you folks have any questions at all on, on uh, this, this particular um, sale report? I have a question in general on reserves. So um, just for our own clarification, when, when we've talked uh, a couple of times recently about having a little, okay, not the greatest choice word, but a little extra left that we haven't spent this year, um, that's in the reserves, correct? Or is that a different bucket? Yeah, I think that's, that's what Mr. Egan is talking about. You know, when we look at what our general fund, fund balance is versus what we, our expenditures for the year, we've been in that 50 to 60% range so we've been knowing that we've been close to 60 ish we've been okay with spending down closer to 50. I mean I know what Todd's talking about it is a balance between raising the levy too much and wanting higher reserves or whatever versus I think if we're around 50 percent we're for a double a plus we're fine and and even to his comments as far as the the weak debt profile any growing city that's not built out pretty much a lot of our peers whether it's Waconia or Victoria or Mound I'm guessing if you look yeah, at the yeah. same you know yeah reports. Edina's weak, Laconia's weak, not so, very weak, but you know. it's just the it's the straight percentages that the, the credit raters look at or whatever. They don't really take into account if you're fully built out, if you're growing, if you're paying for infrastructure. So it's it's hard to compare to other cities. They, everyone has something different going on. So right. Yeah. Well and and my point is so there's been some, you know, concern or comments as far as if uh, choosing our levy amount for this year so that we don't have as much left over as we have, I mean, for our, our, our levy amount for 2018 so that we don't have as, you know, left over like we did this past year or the year before. But we don't want to have so much left over that the, the pendulum has swung too far, but having a little extra left over does positively affect our rating, which then also results in us getting a better interest rate uh, when we're borrowing money. Correct, yeah. And you'll have more eyes on it, you'll attract more bidders, that's the theory too, which will drive that cost down. Because you'll be, so that you would be at the highest rating then. So, yeah, so it's not a bad thing. But yeah, double A plus is really good. I'm gonna have to give um, I, I'm gonna have to give the two minute warning here real quick. Um, then we're gonna have to take a five minute break and come back because our our tape is gonna be running out here. So, do you want a motion for the um, first one first? Then. Yeah, if you like what you see, there's a bond resolution um, written by Kennedy Graham, your bond counsel, for uh, the acceptance of that bid. 
So that would be um, approve the resolution number 159-17, which is a resolution awarding the sale of the general obligation bond series 2017A in the original aggregate principal amount of three million one hundred dollars, fixing their form and specifications. One, three, three million. Three, three million. million. One hundred thousand. Yeah. yeah, yeah, three million. Um, three million one hundred thousand. Did I see? I think you just said three million one hundred. Oh, three million one hundred thousand. Sorry, fixing their form and specifications, directing their execution and delivering, and providing for their payment. So moved. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay. Are there any other questions? Comments? Great, great interest rate. I'm excited about that. Also excited that we only have to borrow 3.1 million versus 3.25. So with that, um, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes 5-0. So we're going to take a quick break and then come back and complete this. And I, we're just taking a break. <laughs> Five minute break. <laughs> Well, he doesn't have to, we, we'll just start. You know, he'll come, he doesn't have to say anything at the beginning anyway. Okay, so next um, on our agenda is uh, the consideration of proposals for the, um, which we received this morning as um, the other one, for the purchase of the city's uh, geo improvement refunding bonds. Thank, uh, thank you, Mayor, Council Members. Um, the Series B bonds, um, we received a bids uh, on those two uh, up till 11 o'clock today as well. Um, these were these are to refinance um, the 2013A bonds for an interest cost savings. We're just swapping lower interest rate bonds, uh, high, lower interest rate bonds for the higher interest rate bonds, and they finance the construction of the Highway 7 roundabout related to the Kings Point Road project. In the city, so same bond rating, double A plus stable. Um, we received two bids on that, which um, was respectable. Um, we talked about that at the pre sale report. Uh, it's probably what we would get uh, because these bonds, remember, are callable at any time um, as you know, lots get sold and so on out there that we tend to prepay uh, bonds immediately, turn around, prepay them with cash. Um, in that circumstance, within this circumstance, we were doing that plus. Uh, taking advantage of the lower interest rate environment we have right now. So uh, the best bid was, uh, again, on this one, Northland Securities out of Minneapolis went in with the three uh, other under A firms at 2.2695% true interest cost. Uh, the second uh, and last bid was FTN Financial Capital Markets out of Memphis, Tennessee at 2.42%. Uh, so this bond is 20 basis points or 0.2% uh, lower than what we showed on the pre-sale report. Um, so just to cut to the chase on this, uh, the savings on this one is up about $52,630. Uh, Over what you had have yeah. in your packet. Mm -hmm. uh, yep, and so we're at $191,059 uh, on this bond issue, so we'll under 200 grand on this. That will save in interest. In interest. Okay. Yep. yep. Okay. Yeah, and so. And that's just for the the B. Yep. Okay. Just and for the, the B bond. Yep. Okay. And so, pre-sale was looking at um, about 3.5 percent uh, average rate, and so we're at about uh, two for the average interest rate, so down one and a half percent on that as well. So yep. So this one it was a great bond sale. I'm really happy again that. We had some interested bidders here that uh, took into account that call to any time feature. Um, we pay a little bit more for that in interest cost than we did before back in 2013, so it all works out great. So it's apples to apples. Uh, mm -hmm. Great savings on us. Congratulations as well. So again, same same rating report um, and such on this as well. So. All right. Great. So there, if you like what you see, we got another bond resolution for you. Draft yep. Another bond attorney for consideration. And this too is slightly lower than what's in our packet. In our packet, it was two million eight hundred and sixty thousand, and this one is two million eight hundred and forty-five thousand. 
So um, I'm looking for a resolution awarding the sale of General Obligation Improvement Refunding Bonds Series 2017B in the original aggregate principal amount of $2,845,000, uh, fixing their form and specifications, directing their execution de and delivery, providing for their payment, and providing for the redemption of bonds, refunding thereby. I think that's it. Yep. So moved. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, a motion has been made by Ms. Mortensen and seconded by Ms. Bruce. Any further questions? All those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. Great. One more. All right, so we have the 2017 C bonds. Um, this is a taxable general obligation refunding. Uh, this had a few uh, components to it. Um, it's refinancing the taxable bonds of 2013B for an interest cost savings, again swapping a higher uh, rate bond for a lower interest rate bond, and we're also putting some cash into this from the prepaid special assessments that we normally do, so kind of two things going on here. Again, and they finance the construction of the Kings Point Road Project Phase phase 2. So this one had um, the Woodland Cove uh, portion in here, uh, a little bit of residential portion, and there's some city uh, utility uh, as well. So there's a couple other portions of this bond issue that have come along uh, for the ride, so to speak, on this for interest cost savings. This one, uh, same bond rating again, the A plus stable, congratulations. Um, two bids were received on this again, it's nice to see, uh, but a little bit different uh, bidding uh, on this one. So your best bid was Piper Jaffrey out of Minneapolis at 2.81 to seven true interest cost and Northland Securities was second at 3.0902%. Uh, Again, um, this competitively bidding, they mentioned that on that one prior bid, difference between the low bid and the high bid is about over $44,000. So again, um, who knew that Piper was gonna win something like this? Um, we're just to negotiate with them, so it's great to put it off a bit and see who comes uh, mm -hmm. to play. So this one, um, this one happened to kind of switch around a little bit at the Piper, so that's great. It was in their wheelhouse, uh, more so than the North. Um, appreciate both bids, though. Uh, this this bond issue, um, the savings on this one was up eighty four thousand three hundred and thirty three dollars from the pre sale over twelve years remaining. On it, we're at two hundred and twenty-three thousand two hundred six. So we broke over the two hundred thousand dollar mark, which was great. Uh, so you're saying that savings? Uh, yeah. Well, savings. Yeah. Yeah. Two twenty-three. Yeah, and I think it's uh, you know these are over seven percent present value savings per percentage. I mean, you know, we feel between a four and a six percent is a great refund in our office. So yeah, good. This is respectively good. Um, on this one, we're exchanging, a, you know, I think a 4.3% average interest rate on the old bond to 2.6. Um, um, yeah, so that was a, a very nice uh, bond sale as well, and it is uh, all firm and fixed, and um, if you have any questions, let me know. This one actually dropped 20 grand um, mm -hmm. because of uh, the reduction in underwriter's discount, which is the underwriter's fee and reduction cost additions, uh, the one before it dropped 15,000 because of that. So mm -hmm. the B and the C bond didn't have a premium on them, those were just bid with, with the hard bids, so they're easier to understand that way. So those just, these just dropped because of the cost dropped. Yeah. So we're at uh, <coughs> 2 million 370 instead of 2 million 390, yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, so any questions? Comments, otherwise, um, yeah. we're again, 223,000 over $223,000 in savings over the life, remaining life of the loan is, is great news, wonderful. Um, okay, so what is your pleasure? So this, yeah, this would be on page 85. This too. is 85, yep. and it's um, a resolution awarding the sale of taxable general obligation improvement refunding bonds, series 2017C in the original aggregate principal amount of 2370000 fixing their form and specifications, directing their execution and delivery, providing for their payment, and providing for the redemption of bonds refunding thereby. So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, motion has been made by Ms. Thole and seconded by Mr. Molitor. 
Any further questions, discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes 5-0. So thank you, Mr. Hagen. Thanks again for the business. <laughs> uh, I appreciate it. It's always well, good to come with good news. Yeah, it's it is. Fun working with the team here. So good. I appreciate it. I do have some proposal forms on how long the meeting's going to go, but I need the mayor to sign each one of these and then Mike. Okay. So I can just drop it off with you and yep. catch it off with the side. Thank you very much. All right. Thank, thank you. Okay, that concludes our bond sales um, in issuance, and we'll move on to a professional service agreement for our wellhead protection program plan. Uh, Madam Mayor and members of the council, uh, the next step in your wellhead protection plan is to have an implementation plan. Uh, WSB has provided a <coughs> proposal to complete the uh, implementation plan through wellhead protection plan part two, uh, and. Uh, this is a requirement of the Minnesota rules. Um, two things here to look at is that um, there, is a gr there are grants available to assist cities with this implementation plan. Uh, the last uh, community besides the Minnetrista, um, we did apply for a grant and got a full $10,000 award. I don't know if that's 100% guaranteed, but that's uh, uh, fairly common. And uh, the proposed fees to complete the um, implementation plan is $11,000, and that's not to exceed. There is a um, the scope of services and proposed fees in a resolution uh, for council consideration of approval. Okay, thank you. Um, so I know uh, two of you are new, but last year we had to do, or you're actually required to do wellhead protection plans. So we've done that, and this is implementing the plan and, and the program, if you will. Um, so we're on the right path. Any questions? I'm just, I'm just curious, what, what, it, what do they do to protect the wellheads? So each one of them, a lot of what we end up doing is uh, actually tracking abandoned or existing wells. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, for instance, we do have in some instances where people are coming off of wells and getting onto the public water system. In those cases, we want to know is that well being abandoned? Is it being abandoned according to the Department of Health uh, requirements? Or are they keeping it for other purposes such as irrigation? Which is allowed in most cases. Mm -hmm. So, we want to track it and want to know when that is abandoned or if it's still in use. And what's the vulnerability uh, that it puts on the city's drinking water. Um, and so we look at where those wells are and where they are within our um, well zones, so our drawdown zone, yeah, that are in our well protection plan. And we just track those and make sure that we aren't having some kind of a use that might be a threat to our drinking water. So okay. essentially that's more of a paperwork and documenting system yeah. in implementing the plan. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. Any other questions? Otherwise, um, do I have a motion to approve the um, agreement with, I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me. I make a motion to approve the resolution 16217 to approve professional services for the Wellhead Protection Plan Part 2 Implementation Plan. Okay, in the amount not to exceed 11,000, right? Exactly. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, a motion has been made and seconded. A motion was made by Ms. Thol and seconded by Ms. Bruce. Any further questions or discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes. So now I have to get back to my agenda. So now um, the next one we added is um, business item E, and that's a discussion regarding the Enchanted and Tuxedo Road projects. Mr. Baroni or Mr. I think I'm going Hornby. to start, and I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Hornby to chime in, especially if I mess <laughs> something up. So, everybody knows that we're in the process of doing the Enchanted Tuxedo Road, road Project. Thanks for me to sign in. Yeah. Um, and I know Mr. Hornby has been fairly diligent talking with our friends over at the MCES, Met Council of Environmental Services, and been asking them as we've been working our way through this project, and generally before, but as we've been working on this, um, 
Is this road in any danger of being, I use the word danger, but any danger of being put on the uh, your 10 year CIP capital plan for improvement? Because they have a horse main that runs through there. Uh, they did have a force main failure last year, I believe June, July, according to Chris Remus, and I spoke with him this afternoon. Chris is the project engineer for MCES that's, that has a, um, oversight of this particular force main project. Um, and so they had one, as I mentioned last year, but they just had another one two weeks ago. And I know we're at the point where we're actually gonna have our, our hired uh, vendors start working on the project this week. And so that presented us with a kind of a unique situation where we're, I'm, I'm verbally giving you this update. We weren't able to get it in the packet because we, we just heard about late in the day on Friday and I was told about it this morning. And so we've been scrambling to try to at least get some details. Uh, my job was to try to get a hold of Chris. He was hard to get a hold of. He was, I think, home with a sick child. He actually called me from home. I left messages with people he works with. So, um, like I said, they've had a second force, fa force main failure two weeks ago. And so they have actually put this force main project on tentatively right now on their schedule for 2018. And of course, so if we're going to do this project, we don't really want to do the project and then have them come in and dig it all up, do their force main project, and then have to repair it. So we've got a couple of things we should talk about here. Um, I did kind of pick Chris's brain a little bit as to how that would work. And it was quite interesting to listen to it. So this pipe that they have in the ground there was put in in the early 70s, and it's a cast iron pipe. And a long time ago and as uh, Paul's talking you know the, the ground might heave and, and frost I don't know how deep the, the pipe is but there's a lot of water out there um, and you're talking about what temperature or whatever is that? Looking at freeze thaw conditions uh, right. and the depth of bury and also looking at um, you know deterioration of the cast iron in that time period yeah. you know you might have pockets where you've got hot soils that will eat up your pipe and um, don't know what the specific issue was here. Uh, the, the break earlier was at the midsummer was at the boat launch. Yep, near the boat and uh, we're actually that's one of the reasons why in our project we we're going to mill and overlay the boat launch to uh, restore that surface. And then the second break, I'm not uh, specifically sure where that was, but. Um, Met Council is concerned that they have a bigger problem on their hands. So they're still trying to define exactly what project they're going to do. Right. But it does affect what we're going to do. Yes. So we have, a, I see it as we have essentially a couple of choices. We could do the project and not do the chunk of the area that Met Council's already identified. I think it's 1,100, 1,200 feet in length about a third of our overall project between Tuxedo and Enchanted. And then when, and then adjust our contract with our vendor accordingly, according to Paul, we can change the contract. If I was the vendor, my question to Paul was, you know, are they going to be mad that we're knocking off about a third of their project? And we have the right to do that for whatever reason in the contract. So yeah, they might be upset, but we can actually do that. And then let that council build the road when they do their um, uh, force main uh, work next year, build it to our specifications that we've already delineated. It may not need as vendor, but they would have to build it to our spec. That's one option. The negative on that is um, that there would be two construction seasons for folks that live out in that direction. There would be one this year, probably a little shorter, because they're not doing as long of a road, but there would still be a construction season. And then they'd be having another one next year. Uh, the other option, obviously, is to wait and do it all next year, and then we'd have to negotiate, or however you want to say it, figure out what we got to do to work with Met Council to have them pay for some percentage, if not all, of the chunk that's affected, and then we'll do the other part. So, uh, I don't know how that would play out. These are all things that we'll, we'll have to consider. Um, did ask him, I said, well, how invasive is your process that you would do the uh, force main? And he said, I said, well, we've done a directional drilling here when we just did our water main a year ago. 
and he said it's very similar to that. He called it um, pipe bursting method. So they take a pipe that's almost the same size, or actually I think a little larger in size <coughs> than the current pipe, and they essentially use a directional drilling process. And as the new pipe gets inserted into the old pipe, it kind of fillets it and blows it apart. And you have a new pipe come right in the same corridor as the old existing pipe, except it kind of pulls all the pieces out of the way. So you actually don't have to open cut, except in small areas, just like we did with our, our uh, process where you might have turns in the pipe or whatever. So they would minimize those, but that would be the, the method that they would use. He says basically it's trenchless. You know, I mean, you're not gonna have a lot of open cut things. Um, the other factor in this is whatever we end up doing, we're gonna have to talk to our residents somehow. I don't think just shooting in the letter is probably gonna be enough. Might have to have an open house and so they can understand it. But it kind of puts us in a tough timeline because we don't exactly know how long it's gonna be before Met Council kind of figures out what they're gonna do and when they're gonna figure it out since they just, they've been probably working on it for two weeks, you know, since that last burst or something less than that, you know. So, and we're just now hearing about it? Well, yeah, but I mean, it's their issue, their, 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 their pipe, you know, so it's not our pipe, but you know, as, as Paul connected with them last week, you know, they called us, and I believe they called us, and said, yeah, we got an issue out there now, yeah. so. So they, so they pulled me aside after another meeting that um, Gary, Mike, and I were at um, for the Cone Road 44 mm -hmm. uh, Mount Force meeting that they're running for 2018-19 and pulled me aside after that meeting to talk about an issue they know that we, they know we had a um, road improvement project because right. they know I've asked about their improvements out there right. and they know what their answer was. So they wanted to talk to me a little bit. They are still talking about what their process may or may not be. So I, even this morning, talked to um, Chris and then one other um, uh, agreement person uh, at the Met Council I think it's his boss. And yeah. to uh, talk about how we might do this. And it's not clear, you know, pipe bursting is one. They're still talking about maybe open cutting, depending on what we required they did. Uh, I think we have a lot of options and not enough information to make a great decision. Um, and so Mike and I were going over this today as far as what kind of options we would have. Um, and our contractor wanted to, want his plan to mobilize the 21st. So this week, mm -hmm. Thursday. Mm -hmm. So it's a tough spot we're in. Um, Paul wasn't able to connect with the supervisor for this project. He was able to connect with somebody at the painting company. Correct me if uh, their name again was Brandt. Yeah, I yeah. talked to. Yeah. So <coughs> we haven't we haven't talked with a guy that's going to be the supervisor on this project. But we talked to somebody else. He talked to somebody else. So. I mean, if you had to ask me today, I think we go ahead and do it, even though it's going to be an inconvenience for the residents there to kind of put up with two construction seasons. They'll probably be short. I was asking him to give me a timeline. And I know our water main project was about six weeks last year, and that was directional drilling in the dirt. We didn't have a pipe we were following. Mm -hmm. So he made it sound like it'd be about that kind of timeline, although he said, you can't hold me to it. And I said, I wouldn't, but I'm just, I need something. So, so it's a tough spot we're in, um, but like I said, um, maybe, and with them mobilizing and going this week, we almost have to decide tonight to tell them after we've a little bit more work about where we're at, what we need to do here. So it's kind of, a, like I said, it's a tough spot to put you in, it's a tough spot for us to be in to kind of figure out what we gotta do in a short amount of time, not knowing all the details, and really don't wanna bank on that council saying they're gonna do it, who knows if they change their mind the whole season so um, it's a lot to consider so. um, not a good situation obviously it's not something we could no. uh, have any control over no. uh, one question I have if we were to do you know the one road leave leave you the one have. patch do the next right. part then when they come in to do their part they're gonna be bringing heavy equipment yep. in over that brand new road Correct. and that just doesn't sound like a good idea to me um, that's just one piece. The other is, you know, how about our financing? I mean, does this affect our financing, the, the way that we had that? And, and then, of course, you know, at the mercy of the Met Council, well, who knows how Correct. their schedule is going to go or might get changed in the next 
one months one. before spring. But the, the heavy equipment on the road is a big concern, and I, I didn't know what our commitment is as far as the, the financing piece is. What if we go ahead and, I'm just thinking out loud here, if we go ahead and do our project, I mean, it sounds like there's a couple different options that can either right. do that pipe, or, I mean, if we say we have this, can we, I know, can we force their hand a little bit by saying, you know, we've done our road, now try, can you please do it, <laughs> you know, the, the trench, or the one that's more the pipe, or? plan on doing that. I think their That's preference would be to do it that way, but there's, they, there will still be excavation where you have to make turns. Right. There, there, there will be. They but can't they try to minimize it, I guess? Or? Yeah, anytime if you've got a sharp bend where they've got a, a structure, so they're going to pipe for a structure to structure, um, they're going to have an excavation at that location. But I could just see this playing out. I mean, we waited for Shorewood first to try to do the project together, and now all of a sudden, what if Met Council doesn't do this in 2018 and it's 19 or 20? and Right. It just keeps going on and on. Well, so we so we do have a contract in place. Um, the uh, we've got a pre-con pre-construction meeting. I'd almost suggest that we work in the areas outside of where the force main is, and make a decision on whether to keep that section out of the project, and what our options are going to be with the Met Council when they more figure out what they're going to do. When would we know that? That's uh, well, they made it sound like it was this fall, so I don't think it's going to be in like in a week or two. Yeah, like through their budget process, I suppose they'll solidify something. They and have to get their just, capital yeah, plan like, and get their improvement dollars set aside. So it's probably going to be through the fall. later in the fall before we know what, what they're doing or early winter. For sure, they won't do it till next year. Yeah, it's the construction not would not occur until 2018. Right. Right. So options would be either to pull our pull this section out of the contract completely or leave it in just with knowing that our contractor is going to leave it out for now. Maybe we'll take it out of the contract completely and have them at council bid it with their project. Um, or have them delay this section which would require, you know, there's going to be additional costs for construction in 2018. I suspect in labor and material remobilization for a contractor, the goal would be is not to have the city incur those costs because of the Met Council. And I had that discussion with um, uh, Karen Keenan and Chris Ramis this morning and figuring how we would do that. And they're, so they're talking among themselves and how they, what kind of a joint powers agreement they can put together to get this to work or a cooperative agreement. So there's still a lot of, um, we're juggling a lot of items Moving in the parts. air here with it. So. Um, it does. The unfortunate part is for our residents is it puts two years of construction on their plate, yeah. where they've already endured what three years with the mound improvements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there a part of the road to to uh, to what degree do we know where this second break is and how much of the road is beyond that? As far as could we? do that part of the project that, that the equipment wouldn't have to drive over? I'll just pass this down. It's just a photo. The area in green is the segment in which they would, um, what they have to, they're going to replace their force main. So that segment is what they're looking at. It's, we have area we can work on on either side right of the it. Middle. <laughs> it's basically right. It's across, it's on either side of the bridge. Yep. I, I have a question about Who's responsible for if if we were to just go with the project as it is and go ahead and pave it and then they come in and they wreck it. they wreck it? Aren't they responsible for restoring it to the condition it was in before? Yes. I mean, then you'll have a patch in your roadway. That's the thing we always try to avoid. You know, in the you old know, days of construction, a, I mean, it's a it's a reclamation. So we're going to do a seal coat eventually right at Correct. some point in a year yep well probably somewhere in the first three to five years we'll do a seal coat on it but but at least we wouldn't be damaging the damaging road that that we don't need to and they would be responsible for repairing any damage that they did right which That's seems true. to make yeah. financial sense to to just go ahead and do it and let them do their work later and repair 
That's kind of what Brian is saying because we, we don't know what's going to happen with them. Yeah, I wouldn't want to comment I agree. on anybody, I guess, yeah. just based on what we had with Sherwin and, and their project. I mean, I think you guys are saying the same yeah. thing. Yeah. 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 And just so based some on of those my experiences <laughs> with their Highway 7 project and Lotus, how many times, Paul, has that been delayed? They yeah. say they're going to do it, and it's always a funding mm -hmm. issue. Yeah. I mean, how, yeah. how they think they have the funding all of a sudden to do this next yeah. year is beyond... Maybe. I think it's just at the front of their mind you know, because I, it happened right now. But then you know, two weeks later, asking the same question, it's, it won't be such a big deal. The break was fixed or whatever. So I, mm -hmm. I think we move ahead with our project as is. So could, we could. That's definitely an option. In those areas that they need to mm -hmm. dig up, they would just saw cut the pavement just like the rest of them would do and patch it and restore it. And, yeah. yeah, patch or, it, redo it. Or, yeah. I mean, we don't want a, a brand new road that's patched. We want it back to where it was. Well, you'll have a patch in your brand new road. Yes. Well, there'll be a seam there. There'll be a, there'll be a seam. It won't look like the road looks today with a, you know, a pothole patching. Yeah. Yeah. It'll look like a, it'll be a refined. It'll be a better patch. Yes. Yeah. Essentially, yeah. yes, it yeah. would be a better patch. So, <clears throat> I, I do have one question, a couple questions. Um, what we will do here is we'll do the initial reclamation this fall, and then we do a final top coat next spring. No, nope, this year we would do the, the base thing. and wear all in one yep. shot. All in one shot, okay. Yep. Do we have an option of moving that top coat out? Well, you could do that too. I mean, that's an option. Well, so yeah, what yeah. I'm thinking is that to get to your point about the patches at least not being visible, if we did the top coat after Met Council got their work done, the whole thing would then at least look... Yes, I suspect what you're going to have is an in increase in cost for 2018 in labor and materials and also additional mobilization for the contractor. So but it would just be on doing the wear final course. Yeah. wear coat, yeah. Yeah. which should be less than the initialization of the whole thing. Now, the only the one concern I would have is that um, with only one, you know, a two inch layer of bituminous down, your road is not going to be as strong as it would be with all four inches of bituminous on it. I and think so you probably get, should go with And you the, could get some damage. Yeah. And the other thing you could do Especially is. Especially with that road, I'm saying. Maybe, if, maybe if we uh, take Councilmember Bruce's approach and just do our project uh, start to finish. And as David mentioned, you know, we're going to seal coat it some way. Maybe we just ask them to seal coat it next year, and that's their contribution to wrecking our road. You know, to say, hey, well, we're going to do our project. We know you might do it next year, but you might not. Because we know you guys probably better than they know themselves. So that we could say, well, how about we just push up the seal coat so at least we can cover up the, the seam, the better patch next year. And say, you guys pay for that. I don't know. I think there's or whatever a, else they might wreck. So. Well, you, I think first of all, we need to tell them, I, I agree, I think we should do the project now. And then second of all, I think we need to tell them that we are going to have to go ahead. They didn't inform us in a timely manner. And then if they have to dig up our road, it's going to be put back to this the brand new condition that it is. And, and in addition, they're going to have to seal coat to cover up those seams. I, and I don't want patching. If they're going to have to dig up an area and then dig up another area, they're going to dig up the whole area and redo the whole area. So well, typically, when, to we standard have. though, to standard is it the current standard? Can you or are you saying city standard? Because aren't you in theory going to get a better road if you tell them to city standard? Well, we probably wouldn't do the city standard here, and the reason for that is because we're not going to put, we're not going to introduce sand in the subgrade, so we would match the section that we create with the, so we restore it in kind. So if we result in a foot of aggregate base and four inches of pavement, when we do our reclamation, that's what we'll end up with mm -hmm. in the finished patch. Well, I wonder what their, they, you said, or that, that they are concerned that they might have a bigger issue so, I mean, I mean, what's their strategy on that going to be? How are they going to determine if they have other pipes that are uh, compromised or could potentially be breaking, or are they just going to mm -hmm. wait it out and see if a third one breaks? Well, you know, this is all, this actually is a force main. It's a pressure pipe that is made out of cast iron. Um, the rest of it is um, plastic pipe that was put in as gravity sewer. So. What they have is a cast iron force main that is deteriorated to some extent, and that, that is what has to be replaced. And that's what is shown in that 
green line on that photo I sent around. That's for the <coughs> cast right. iron is. And so their intent is, well, if they thing. did the short fix, they would just put a short liner where the brakes were. Um, that's all fine and dandy. That doesn't mean they're not going to have more brakes in the future. Yeah. So they're looking at a complete replacement through pipe bursting, as Mike had mentioned. Yeah, I asked him today about lining, and he said, well, with the age of this pipe and the condition, now we've got two brakes in one a year in the last two years. He says, we can't line it because it's just going to break again. So mm -hmm. we're going to try the pipe bursting technique or some other invasive, non invasive technique. What about, okay, so we're out there with this heavy equipment right over this pipe that's fragile, and we're doing this reclamation project. How is that going to affect the pipe? Well, typically with the depth, um, I'm, not that, I'm not too concerned about that. I think the other, I think the issue has been more deterioration. Okay, deterioration. all right. Okay, so. I have a quick yeah. question. How will this affect the assessments? Sure. Not at all. Yes. Not if we go so. forward with the right. project right now okay. as is. Even though they won't have it so. done for who knows how long. Well, well, well our project, it, we yeah. will continue well, the project and do it this fall, yeah. as we planned. Mm -hmm. okay. That would be the, 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 the question you might get from residents mm -hmm. in the future is, we just paid for this road, now you got somebody out here digging it up. Right, oh, right. that's exactly what I said at the end. But I th we gotta talk about it. I so think long. when we do it well, somehow we're gonna have to we're communicate to that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah, so we'll have to have a, a neighborhood meeting Soon. Well, I don't know if we. For the next. I don't know if we want to have this neighborhood meeting soon. Not, not that I'm saying we're we're not sharing information, but until we know what Met Council is going to do and when, yeah. I don't want to tell the residents that oh, by the way, we're going to mess everything up next year because Met Council, and then Met Council decides, ah, eh, we can wait five years. And uh, right. I guess well, I, to your point, yeah, I agree, but yeah. let's wait until we know what Met Council is going to do. True, but I I, I think there's. I think it would be fair to them to say that here's what's going on. Like you said, it could be five years. We don't know. Right. My guess is it's not going to be, but the way I was talking with uh, Mr. Remus, but it could be. Because well, yeah. it wasn't even in their 10 year plan, right? Even now so I know it's always in their one year right, plan right. from not in their 10 year plan. So, so now, yeah. now we've got to you know, try to speak on behalf of Met Council for what they don't even know what they're doing. Well, I get that. Yeah, right. I would say I'm speaking on behalf of them, but I would say here's what they told us. Take it for what it's worth, but we're doing our project, and if they come back next year, just so you know, they might come back next year, uh, they'll fix the road up back to our standard that we want it back to. But you know, they're kind of, in an un I think, in an unavoidable spot. It just happens to impact our road. So it kind of stinks, but. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. Okay. Any other questions? Can is it possible to negotiate with Med Council to have them pick up a cost for part of our road if we make things easier for them to do their work? How would we make it easier for them to do their work? I mean, if, if, if we didn't pay oh, that, that one section, if we didn't do yeah. that one yeah. section, yeah. and it was yeah. gonna. I mean, there's got to be some. Benefit to them. Benefit to them. Yeah. And what is that worth? But that could be impacted by the schedule the contractor has to do our road. So, you know, we've got that, yeah. that clicking away over here, and then we got to go talk with them over there. And they weighed us up. They kind of have us on that one. But that kind of gets back to what Brian and David were saying in terms of we don't know what they might change their right. mind. I and mean, we've had this in the budget for a couple of years now with the yeah. plan it's already been in 2017. Yeah. Year for I mean, the only reason so that, that they're even... The bond or the funding. I mean, ultimately, this maybe would have even been done this summer already. It just got sort of delayed because we waited for Shorewood, et cetera, you know, so... I, I think we, we just, yeah. I think we just move forward, I guess, or... Who would make them fix it, I guess. Yeah. yeah. One other question on this project, but not directly to this. Last time, we were having issues with the watershed district on permitting. I assume those are taken care of, or we still got those hanging out there too. So their permit should be um, we the end of our con the comment period is the twentieth. So we should be free to go on the twenty first. The permit should be issued. So that the contractor is looking to mobilize on the twenty first. Oh, right, That's based fine. on that timeline. Mm -hmm. And the, the boat launch will be closed for that for the duration of the project, the contractor will be using the boat launch for material and equipment staging. Okay. I don't think the I don't think we're going to delay the project, but if we were to, are there penalties that we would have to pay the people that we contracted with to do to do the work? 
we would end up negotiating a change order. We extend the bid date. We extend the completion date. Um, it's very likely going would the city would incur additional costs. I I suspect for labor materials and remobilization of equipment. So um, yes, there would be additional cost over and what you have bid today to do that. They're planning equipment in Manpower as we speak probably exactly. for Thursday. Exactly. So yeah, right. They probably you know, if you cut them off today, they're going to Parked at the drive-in. So. Mm -hmm. And it may be costly. It's true. I think, you know, they would know they had us over a barrel, so it would be costly. Well, and the, the discussion with the Met Council would be that the city would exceed no additional cost if we delayed the project or a portion of it for their work. Mm -hmm. And so... They're trying to figure out how they would do that. They said, I don't know how we would have an agreement to pay for a delay. And I said, well, it's not a delay. You would, it would be in a negotiated agreement to pay a cost up of and beyond uh, what the city would have incurred under their contract in constructing it in 2017. So that's where the conversation was going, not paying for part of a delay. Or the other thing would be is, Take that part out of the contract, and when they finish their force main, then they have to make the road improvement as part of their contract. It'd be different if we hadn't let a contract, but I mean, MCS, right. they got to realize we've let a contract. Yep. We've, I mean, we're just, right. Right. I, I think either way that we make this a decision tonight on it, um, Met Council's going to be fine with it. Uh, they just don't, they'll end up having to do some patchwork on the, on the roadway. And like Mr. Brony said, maybe they have to pay for a silk coating. So, so rather than later. Yep. Okay. All right. So well, move, we move forward. Well, appreciate your feedback. We're, we're going to apologize. I'll apologize because how much we can do about it, but at least we're grateful that you guys are willing uh -huh. to kind of brainstorm with us on how best to proceed on this. So I think I'm hearing that you just like full speed ahead, and then we'll see what we got to do with our friends at MCES and talk about what they got to do to kind of make us quote all on this thing. Yeah. So, whether it's this year or next year. <coughs> okay. All right. Um, moving on to administrative items, staff reports, city administrator. You um, want to start? I have one item. Um, I don't know if we put a picture out there or not. Did we stand right yep. the folder? So if you can find there's, you can see our merry faces there at go. the, we'll there we are, at the uh, ribbon cutting this past week. Um, so that was held, and I thought it, thought it was very well. Now, I know the newspaper has been going through a transition in their staffing. Uh, their, <coughs> the person that was covering us is no longer there. And so Cassandra quickly sent them this picture and a nice press release, and it didn't go in the paper. <laughs> what we have been pressuring them to do is to put stuff in there that we gave them before, and so if you saw in the last edition, we said, Joni's farewell was in there, yeah. even though it was July. It was not for <laughs> <long> effort. <laughs> so who knows when this will show up, but so I thought I'd show everybody tonight, because um, it could be weeks before it actually shows yes. up in the paper. Yeah. So they got a couple of things that were sitting in the hopper there that we've been bugging them about. Mm -hmm. So I know it's a staffing thing with them, but mm -hmm. so eventually I'm sure this will show up, but that was the one I, I just want to make sure that we tried <coughs> to get it in the paper last week and mm -hmm. we did hit their deadline. So, and the only other thing is, uh, if you want to just give a quick update, Cassandra, on the, the CSO staffing. Oh, process. sure. Um, we have five CSO interviews scheduled for this Friday, so we're hoping to find a candidate in that process. We had, I want to say, nine or ten in total apply, um, which is an uptick from what we had the last time or so around. So I'm hopeful about that. It looks like we have some potentially good candidates. So we'll do those interviews on Friday. Our goal, um, Chief Falls is in those interviews. Our goal is hopefully to have run around and find the right candidate. And if we don't, then we'll continue to move forward. So. Good. Any other staff <coughs> update? That's all we have. All right. Then I'll, so. I'll start um, real quick. So. Um, Public Safety Committee meeting on Tuesday of last week, Northwest League on Wednesday. Um, it, we didn't have a speaker. It was uh, basically just up city updates, and most of it was discussion around budgets. And I will say um, many of the cities are looking at between a 4 and 7% preliminary levy increase. Uh, there were very few, uh, there might have been one that was less than that, but very, most of them were right in that four to seven. There was one that was quite a bit more. And the other thing, I mean, not that it makes a huge difference or matters, but um, there was some discussion on um, 
tax rates, and we're actually one of the lower tax, one of the lowest tax rate cities. So that was good news. Um, Gillespie board meeting um, last Thursday, and uh, just a lot going on there. They have some fundraisers going on, raffle tickets that they're selling. So if you're interested, it's fifty-two dollars, but they do these drawings for for uh, cash. So anyway, that's about it. I attended the uh, water treatment plant dedication. Yep. So, which was uh, exciting, or that we've got that uh, completed now. Yep. Uh, big uh, accomplishment for our city, and uh, good water for our, our residents that are on city water now. And uh, I'm in the queue for the September 25th planning commission meeting. Uh, I attended the water treatment plant dedication as well, and it is very exciting yeah, to see that behind us now. Yeah. Very fun. And WCC meeting moved to the 28th, so it will be next week. Okay. And Mike? Um, L LMCD meeting, um, the biggest item out of there will be some additional slips in the seat and channel. So. Okay. Are those tied to the new black? Or is that Back gym? Um, no, um, that was I believe initially requested, but that was administratively denied um, because of the um, those are what we call transient slips and all that's allowed. There are um, permanent parking, yeah. and uh, these were actually approved conditionally in last December when the expansion. Of, it's in that same area. It's those new slips that went in there. Uh, there were five additional slips that were initially approved based on an environmental study. And it looks like we'll probably end up having four out of those five going in. Okay. So. okay. I'll be going to the Pioneer Sarah Creek meeting on Thursday, and hopefully I'll be able to tell them that we're working on a manure management sure. ordinance. Um, and the Parks Commission meeting was canceled for September, so I'm going to be going to the October one. All right. So that concludes our meeting for tonight. If I have a motion to adjourn, we can go home. So moved. Okay. The motion has been made by Ms. Bruce. Is there a second? I'll second that. And Ms. Martinson made the second. All those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes 5-0. I don't think I've ever had anybody say nay. <laughs>